can and, and spend time on things we need to. So let's let's get started with number one, Mike. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Harley. Um, the first thing for your consideration tonight is the district received a donation of eleven thousand dollars in gift cards. An individual who's donating the money would like to remain, remain anonymous, um, but they're looking at five hundred dollars per grade level team in grades K through five, and also for special education at East Pike and some of the specialists. Additionally, this individual would like to give a thousand dollars to the school nurses for ordering supplies, clothes, and other necessities. We are working with Jared uh, to fine tune the details to make sure that we have a protocol in place for people to go ahead through an order, but we'd like to memorialize this by the board adopting it. And then we'll follow up with the letter, uh, thanking the individual and the person would like to meet with us and talk about how they can help in the future. So it's very kind. Uh, it's very gracious. It's very timely. It's very needed. And most importantly, it's appreciated. So I just would like to bring it to the committee's attention to make sure we can approve it on the 10th, sir. No, absolutely no objection for me. I assume the committee is good. I'm trying to find the yes. Okay. Okay. Let's move it ahead. Okay, uh, next on the list, uh, Mr. Harley and committee members is great configuration and next steps. I had a meeting today with the, <clears throat> at 11 o'clock with Rodney Green and SSI. Um, the administration delivered on the items that were requested of us. And now we're, we're going to turn it back over to SSI. And what they're going to do is on January 17th, present, uh, have another work session with the board during the buildings and grounds and transportation committee meeting and walk through an exercise that examines the options uh, available to the board. In this case, we asked them to look at three options. Uh, the fourth one, I didn't find much interest from the board, nor did you ask us to follow up on. But the three options, as you know, are um, one large four or five building at Ike, three K, pre-K to five buildings, and stated, stay in the course. That was one thing the committee brought up last meeting. So that's the exercise they'll walk you through. You could decide how you want to move forward and what you want to do there. They'll be here that evening. The only thing I would request is I think we had a lot of deliberations and conversations on it. If there's anything else you need before that meeting, let me know, and I can either get them answered to you or address them that night so we can be prepared fully. But I think we've done everything that was asked of us. I think respectfully, I'll turn it back over to SSI. Okay, move on. Okay, uh, the next one, I'd like to um, spend some time talking to the committee about the need for some mental health workers and how we'd like to expand this program. We started at Ben Franklin, and we'd like to have a conversation about how we expand this framework to other schools in the district. When you look at what's going on in Michigan and other schools and uh, throughout the United States, we would argue prevention and support are crucial. And what we're asking to have a conversation about tonight, we'd like to show you, present to you, that's also aligned with our MTSS vision and model in this area of behavioral and SEL. Um, we have to be upfront with you. There would be a big expenditure attached to this uh, in the area of $360,000 for the rest of this year and all of next year. Um, and we'd like to use ESSER funds to support this if the board so choose. Uh, my, my goal is to go over with you and talk to you a little bit about it, but also make you aware that this would eventually become a district expense if the board wanted to maintain these supports. What I'd like to do is turn the floor over to everyone. We have Dr. McMaster's online. We have our principals here and we have uh, Dr. Rungi. We've been talking to Dr. McGowan uh, about what happened in Michigan. We've been looking at PCCD and some of the different requirements and frameworks that have come out through uh, threat assessment. And what our position is tonight to have a conversation with you about is we don't think you can have a one size fits all for identifying school threats or school shooters. We do think you can have a series of uh, supports and a series of ingredients that go in to be preventative in nature. And that's through our MTSS model. What we're proposing tonight is just part of that MTSS model. It's probably a tier two and or tier three intervention that will go a long way in helping address some of the anxieties, mental health and mental trauma issues that some of our students face. Justin had prepared some numbers. We're gonna talk about some of the ODRs that we're getting through the district. He's also gonna talk about the need. Uh, Dr. Rungi, if it's okay with you, I'd like to hear your input on this one as well, but we think this is a step in the right direction is looking as far as being preventive in nature. Uh, but it does come with a significant cost. It, there is some issues dealing with it. But when you look at our MTSS system as a whole, this is part of the recipe that we think could be used to help really address some of the needs of our kids. We would argue that if you look what happened during the pandemic and what's going to continue to happen during the pandemic, mental supports are going to be needed more than ever. Um, our staff, our teachers, our administrators, our counselors, they're doing an incredible job. But we're just maxed out when we look at the mental supports that we need. And where we are. So, with that said, maybe I'll start with Justin, principals, Dr. Rungi, Dr. Price, anyone else who yeah. want to add to it, please do. Mr. Harlan? Before you go on, um, as I understand this, then the 360 will become our users, users for the next year and a half. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, I thought and I then, said that. I apologize. And then, um, if we continue this, it'll be about 240,000. 
It will really, if you continue, it depends on what the board wants to do. You can come back and say, Mike, I don't want four uh, mental health workers. We can lower it down to one or two. So we can, we have some wiggle room and mm -hmm. we can play with those numbers. This, what this number does, sir, this gets That's a mental nice. health worker at East Pike. Um, someone share between Ike and or and Horace Mann and someone at the junior high. The first, the place that it really does not address is the high school. And it doesn't address Horace Mann as far as having their own person. So there would be some shared services. And if you say, well, Mike, why did you do that? Because um, we were looking at the remaining ESSER funds and we were working within those um, within those type of um, uh, availability of funds. Is there this service at the senior high? There's Currently? not in this area, no. Are you able to, to schedule the person part-time there? Or? What Justin and I talked about was, you know, depending how this goes, what we could do is maybe Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday at the junior high, Tuesday and Thursday at the high school. We have different <laughs> options we have to look at. Um, everything we did was stayed within the funds of the grant. This also doesn't preclude us how we can um, reshift funds depending on where we go. For example, this year we budgeted, uh, I think it was for 12 literacy interns through IP, and they gave us, I think, four. So there's some extra money we can look at and play around. I just can't speak to certainty right now, but it is on our radar. So, it is something we want to address. So what this proposal is right now is generally for four people yes, sir. for a year and a half. Yes, sir. <clears throat> And you can get five and the same amount of money and you can go around you don't have a look at that. Are these people available? Well, we had that conversation. I'll defer to Justin. We do think they're available. Uh, we have one at Ben Franklin now, so I'd like when we do it through a conversation, have Kelly speak to the benefits of it. But we're really, they're going to be primarily focused on tier two and tier three. We're going to take the position. Everyone's responsibility it has a responsibility for tier one. Uh, and it includes the principals fact checking and making sure it's being done with fidelity, but as well as teachers implement it. This would primarily be for tier two and tier three students. So is that okay if I turn over to Justin, yeah. give it over? Yeah, just I want to make sure that nope. the nope. money was clear. Go ahead. So um yeah and um it just to just to answer your question, Mr. Harley, um the, yeah they would be able to staff uh, all four positions. Um so yeah the no issue with that. Uh, but I'll get started. <clears throat> so uh, right now in the district we we do a pretty good job of um employing our tier one strategy. So we do school wide positive behavior support where our teachers are teaching the expectations uh, for students and that goes across all settings that goes you know in the cafeteria hallways buses that sort of thing and then we also have you know incentive systems so when students are seen uh, following those expectations you know we have incentives that go with that in addition to that we um, we, we also do paths uh, which is our social emotional learning program and we feel that you know tier one at our elementary school buildings uh, is really going well we also do um, some fidelity checks with what we're what we're currently doing. We do fidelity checks with our PBIS program, uh, and then there's also some fidelity checks with with the PATHS program as well. Uh, so we can kind of check in on that. What what we're proposing here tonight is um, to provide some. So what happens for those students? You know, and and with our tier one programs, they they work for. You know, we hope that they work for all students, but there are some students that you know, have additional risk and additional risk factors that come into play. And uh, with that in mind, one of the things that we've been doing and we started doing it at all buildings with exception of the high school this year is we started doing and at Ben Franklin um, about what, three, two years ago, we started doing a screener. Um, and this screener is um, a way to kind of get an idea of which students might have a medium or a high risk for internalized um, uh, issues like sadness, anxiety, depression, or externalized um, issues like verbal or physical aggression. And what we found at Ben Franklin, the very first year we, we did this screener, was that about, um, it, was a, it was a little bit over 20, I think it was 23% of our student population at Ben Franklin was either at a medium or a high risk um, for either internalized or externalized. Um, you know, behaviors. And so, you know, with that in mind, you know, with, with about a little over 400 students we had that year, it was 83 students that were identified as having a risk. And what I would say, you know, just from my own personal opinion, is that if you have a student that's at medium risk and you're doing nothing about it, I would, my hypothesis would be that that medium risk either stays in medium risk or it becomes a high risk at some point. And my hypothesis for those students that are at high risk would be 
that those students are much, much more likely to experience um, dropout, teen pregnancy, you know, those sort of issues. And so I think um, what our what our thought was, was that if we provide a good solid tier one with school-wide positive behavior support, with PATHS program, with our social emotional learning program, that's not enough. And so what we started doing a couple of years ago with, with so the school board's approval was we provided um, some tier two interventions. And so we started with that screener. We started identifying those students that need additional support. And then we looked at um, providing some interventions. One of the interventions that we do that's that's evidence-based, that has a lot of research, and it's not a ton of work, is something called check-in, check-out. And that all that is is there's a trusted adult that builds a good, solid, positive relationship with that student, touches base with them in the morning, and then touches base with them again at the end of the day. And throughout that process, the classroom teachers are kind of rating that student, how they're doing in each one of their classrooms. So we have some data that we're collecting on those students. And so um, with what's happening at Ben Franklin, we had that first year, we had 83 students that were identified at risk. Uh, this past year, we had 61. So over 20 students uh, were no longer at risk as opposed to uh, prior to that. Uh, and you know, my thought is, is that we're not only you know, providing these interventions, we're, we're saving lives in the, in the process. And so um, with, with that, um, Kelly, I don't know if there's anything you want to say um, in regard to like how that's going at Ben Franklin. And so, so just to, just to give you an idea, the process itself is we collect this data on the students that are at risk. We provide interventions like check in, check out. the The ACRP staff that's there is also providing um, some small groups. Uh, they're providing social skills groups um, through a program called Skill Streaming. And that's a program that's meant to uh, develop students' social skills. We're providing a program, uh, again, another, we're not selecting just on a whim type programs. We're selecting all evidence-based. Another program we use is called Coping CAD, and that's for students that are experiencing anxiety. Um, we do a program called CBITS, and CBITS is for students that are experiencing trauma. Uh, another one we do is, um, it's called Aggression Replacement Training. And um, that's to help, you know, if we have students that have high numbers of physical aggression, um, that's a small group program that um, has shown some, some evidence of effectiveness even here with us. Um, so so that's, a, that's a pretty good overview. What our staff member does at Ben Franklin is they do that check in and check out with a group of students in the morning and again at the end of the day. They also get all of that check in, check out data that's collected by teachers they summarize that into charts and uh, when we meet every two weeks we have data that shows whether students are being successful and whether they're not being successful and that team includes myself um, kelly uh, the acrp staff member guidance counselor um, uh, who else uh, school psychologists so when we meet every two weeks that data is kind of driving our decision making so if we notice that like I said before, if there is a student that has high discipline referral numbers in the area of physical aggression and they have a screener result that has high numbers of, you know, physical acting out or verbal, you know, verbal aggression, we kind of tailor those programs to kind of fit their needs. Just as we would do if, you know, if there's a student that's that's really struggling, struggling in the area of literacy, we would kind of tailor our supports to kind of fit to, to fit that individual student's needs. So the program has been uh, pretty effective. I would, um, you know, Kelly, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think at last we checked, the teachers are doing an awesome job with it. We do check in on the fidelity of um, how we're operating this program. Fidelity has been as good as it's ever been uh, this year. What's this program? What, what are, you, like, are you saying with, like, what is this program that the teachers are getting good at? Is it what the support is that we're trying to get in? The teachers are doing really well at check in and check out. So th what they're doing is they're um, utilizing those forms and they're rating students on a class by class basis. Essentially check in, check out. The check in piece happens all day long. So they're responsible for picking up their check in, check out um, paper and it's broken down by each subject area in each transition. And then the adults, 
in the homeroom with a student checks in all day. Oh, now, my, my goodness, you did a great job following the rules. You were helping others. You were responsible and you were safe. That's awesome. Maybe a recess. Oh, you know what? I kind of saw that you were having a hard time staying safe. What do you think? I think maybe your rating's going to have to be zero because maybe you hit somebody. So all day long, um, they are checking in, though, and that's a good thing because it's helping them regulate their behavior. And, and then at the end of the day, um, again, they're responsible for checking in out with the responsible adult that they checked in with in the morning. And just today, for example, um, I happened to be in the lobby as checkout was happening, and there was a little one that I'd already spoken to that was coming down and looking very glum because now they have to report to this adult that they have a relationship with and, and show that adult, man, I, I made a mistake. And they didn't want to sh open their folder and show, but they did. And they had a great conversation. And by the time the conversation was over, over the child was skipping back to the room and yelling down the hall, and I'm going to have a much better day, great day tomorrow. So we're learning from our mistakes. We're understanding that when we do make a mistake, we can, we can start over and have a better day tomorrow. Um, I think that, you know, Justin, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I would have brought them if I would have known. But I think that one of the greatest things that we saw was such a decrease in behaviors after um, implementing the program for a year. The other thing that I'm excited about is that we're even looking into, you know, with literacy, we do a deeper dive to find out maybe where a child is really struggling. And then we offer some tier two intervention um, during wind time. And we're going to start doing that with behavior as well. We found another um, tool that we can use to do a deeper dive for behavior and really start to um, be more prescriptive for the child to figure out well, what can we do to, to help increase um, the positives. So a lot of great things are happening in this area. And the fact that we can expand it to the other buildings is just going to be an absolutely wonderful thing. And Mr. Arley, if it's okay with you, Mr. Zahorchak, I'd like to Kelly talk about um, our social emotional programming, because I think right now, if you turn on the news, sometimes that word has got twisted, misinterpreted and misunderstood in a lot of different ways. And when you look at some of the different ways to prevent uh, aggressive behavior or god forbid shootings in schools you know it comes down when you look at some of the protective factors one of the biggest things we can teach kids is empathy and, and that's what we teach in paths how to be kind to one another how to understand what someone's going through how to really uh communicate that and not judge people and not hurt people by that and we're seeing that more than ever and i'd ask anyone on the committee to come see uh ben franklin where they implement paths and the teachers are doing an amazing job and that's our tier one support and then this is a tier two and tier three support but also another thing that, you know, we look at protective factors, one of the strongest things you could do is have a strong connection with an adult. And this is another protective factor, you know, we do both through the check and checkout program. But Kelly, do you want to talk about how we teach those type of skills um, in, in class to understand, and try, you know, treat each other well and the points of being kind and what that means and what that looks like? And I remember walking down the hall one day and, and, and uh, I know the kid was lying to me, but I appreciate it. Anyway. He goes, I like your hair. It's like, well, <laughs> I appreciate that. I don't, I don't know if you mean that, but thank you. Uh, it was kind of funny, you know, because I'm, I'm turning gray uh, and my wife, you know, I, just, I, I get made fun of Yeah, right. Since you came to Indiana. Right. Um, but it's working. And we see in our data that the discipline referrals are going down. Uh, we see the numbers going down. But when you layer on the pandemic, we have a whole other set of issues that we have yet to deal with. Uh, and these kids are going through a lot. And our teachers are taxed. Our administrators are taxed this is a step in the right direction and you know again i don't want to be gloom and doom because what happened in michigan was terrible but we should do this because this is the best practice uh, what i gave in front of you you don't have to look at it now is something from nasp about um, ready to learn empowered to teach and then as well as something from the center on international education benchmarking the nine building blocks and what you do when you go through you'll look at the some of the ingredients of what makes a good lasagna in their mind it looks at some of the systems of supports that are in place to be successful at some of the high performing schools are doing and what i ask you to do throughout tonight continue to refer that you'll see we're doing a lot of these um the hard problem is we're not up to scale yet we're not where we want to be this would be a step in the right direction uh if you're willing to consider it but again we'll defer to the board but Kelly, do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of what that tier one level looks like in the area of paths as well as pbas and justin please add in promoting alternative thinking strategies and to be teaching kindergartners you know those alternative thinking strategies is just starting with with that foundation is pretty awesome i will also say that all of my colleagues at the elementary level are 
doing a phenomenal job with Taz. And we're just a year ahead of everybody. We um, we needed to get something in place at Ben Franklin because we were experiencing just a, a lot of um, behavioral issues. So we're just a, we're a year ahead of everybody. Um, and so I think that it has truly transformed my student culture and climate. Um, you know, you walk into any classroom in Ben Franklin and children are going to gravitate towards you and compliment you because we start every day off with compliments. And a, a past student of the day um, has to stand in the front of their peers. The teacher compliments them. So the teacher is modeling what a compliment should look like and sound like. Um, peers then compliment the child. And then we're also having that homeschool connection where the compliment sheet is sent home and parents are then having to write a compliment for their own child, bring it back to school, and that is shared with the class. So we're just really, as silly and, and as little as that sounds, that is truly just beginning to transform what is happening. And then just as we are explicitly teaching students how to learn to read, we're explicitly teaching students about feelings. So we're, we're talking about what your face looks like when you are feeling angry or happy or frustrated and what it feels like on the inside to be angry or happy or frustrated. And then we're teaching coping strategies. Um, the little ones in K and one are taught how to do turtle and uh, there's a whole process for that and they're praised for doing turtle. When they get um, to third, fourth and fifth grade, they are then taught some um, you know, green light, red light strategies um to regulate behavior and and you know internal thoughts and i don't know about the rest of you but the, the conversations that i've had with kids that have had to come to my office because they've made a mistake it's it's been this has been a game changer to, to sit down with the first grader and process um uh, well i was feeling angry and i should have done turtle but instead i i lost it and i and i said something really mean that i shouldn't have said i don't have to do the talking anymore the, the child is already processing what happened, what we could have done differently, and we're taking next steps to, to correct the behavior. So um, it's, it's just been, like I said, just a, a culture transformer at the tier one level. And um, I'm just I'm excited to see where this goes, especially when you, you know our junior high students and our high school students are a little bit older. You know, I hope that you see that they are just able to better regulate and communicate with one another when they're um, feeling frustrated or even happy. With them. It's okay with you, Justin. I'd like to, Dr. McMaster is on the call. We also have Dr. Rungi if any, and Aaron, who's a used to be a counselor as well. If, if anyone want to chime in, because um, we really want to make sure that, you know, we have some ownership of this and you're in, in support of it, not that we're shoving it down your throat. And if we're wrong, we, you know, we don't have to move forward, but we'd like to hear from you as well uh, on the matter, if that's okay. If, if not, that's fine too. Mr. Vukovic. Uh, uh, yes, sir. From a research perspective, the model that Ben Franklin is years has been replicated countless times across Pennsylvania and sorry, and across America, um, actually internationally as well. Uh, what we do know is that schools that implement the kind of the framework that's being implemented at Ben Franklin, we know that a couple of very positive outcomes occur. And while I don't know specifically about, about Ben Franklin, I know that the state is tracking that and I know that Kelly, you and your staff are submitting data to the state, which then I get at IUP and we analyze. So thank you very much for that. Uh, some of those things include reductions in office discipline referrals, uh, reductions in suspensions. That's most notable at the secondary level. So our middle, our junior high and senior high, would, I hope would appreciate that. Fewer out of school placements for kids with IEPs. That, those are very expensive. I'm sure Mr. Zahorchak can speak to that cost as, as well as a few other administrators. Um, we know that inclusive practices occur educationally speaking, so more kids are being educated in the general education setting, which is always a good thing. We know that there's positive outcomes on the academic side of the street as well, when you remove those non-academic barriers to learning, which is what PBIS is intended to do. And if anyone is truly interested, I can get access to a white paper from Pocono Mountain School District, so right here in our own state, it's about 10 or 15 years old, but it looked at, if you implement the three-tiered PBIS model that they're describing, you actually save money in the long run because you're keeping more kids in your building, which is a good thing. Because if I have a kid with a disability, I want my kid to go to the same school as my neighborhood kids. I don't want my kid to have to go to a different school just because they have a disability. So you save in the long run. And I know there's a cost, there's a real cost. Actually, there's an, definitely there's a cost to these layered supports as we've seen here in black and white with the projected annual costs after the ESSER funds are, are, are exhausted. But I think it pays itself in dividends and the evidence base really is there nationally 
statewide and even locally here as well. So I would encourage this board to consider this, even though that is a big, there is a big cost. I do, I do wonder about any sort of cost sharing opportunities that there might be between the district and the agency that's providing those services. Because if the agency is working with students who are medical uh, MA or medical assistance eligible, there's a reimbursement there. So that number could actually be less if you have students who are receiving services from those agencies and they can bill insurance. Um, but that's just something to think about in terms of trying to reduce those costs a little bit. And I know some of that work has already been done in other school districts by that very same agency, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's also important to note that our school counselors are also working hand in hand with um, KCRP and they are also part of the um, tier two and tier three interventions. They are running groups. Our school counselors are um, part of the team that talks about students um, and the progress that they're making every two weeks. And that's also um, been, I think, a really great process, um, Justin, that we all get together. So now it's not just me, you know, talking to this child and seeing this child. We have a whole village of people that is really helping to make the child be successful, worry about the child, reach out to the child's parents. And so it's, 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 it, that has grown. So we have more people that are really invested in caring for that child to make sure that they are successful. And we talk about it every two weeks. You know, we meet every two weeks and we talk about where our children are and um, other things that we need to get in place for anybody that maybe is not um, being successful. So Indiana is really blessed with having a demonstration site here at Ben Franklin and to be able to expand that to your other buildings is a wonderful opportunity that most school districts, especially in this area, do not have that same luxury. So I would encourage you to give it serious consideration. We have a couple of hands raised. Yes. Um, Should we start with Dr. Masters? Is that okay? Because uh, she's yeah, going to add to the uh, conversation. We, we is that have, okay? Uh, let's go to Angela, then Tammy, then Tamara. Okay. Uh, okay. Dr. Masters. Angela. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to share that I'm echoing. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, that I think that everything that's been shared is spot on. Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the principals, but I know our MTSS team has had a lot of conversations with our school counselors, with our building principals, because there is definitely a substantial need for mental health support. And we've had students who are grieving the loss of family members. We have teachers grieving the loss of family members. Um, so the pandemic, I think, is taking a greater hit currently on some of our students' needs. And just myself even being in the buildings, there is this sense of staff and students really seeking support. So from our MTSS side, um, I've started working with our four or five buildings and working with the teachers to kind of have open discussions about mental health and self-care and how to help students and how we can... Um, look at those protective factors that we can know about or the risk factors that we have to attend to. But when it comes to the needs of those in tier two and tier three, we're getting to a place with some students where there's not enough of us to go around to meet all of their needs that are bubbling up. And um, I did a voluntary sign up session at Eisenhower for calm down kits, which was advertised as like big feelings, come build a calm down kit. And I think I had 25 students sign up on their own, and I probably knew two of them. So that, to me, spoke volumes of 9- and 10-year-olds saying, hey, I think I need this. Um, and we had great conversations. So I just think that the more we can continue to educate our students and our teachers and our administrators and then have those supports for kids, community resources have been pretty limited, and it's been difficult for families to get connected. So that's my two cents. I would strongly support it. Um, Tammy? Tammy? Yes, um, I just want to say that I strongly support this. Um, but I also think they can't be emphasized about uh, enough about how much the coping mechanisms that they we're teaching the grade school and, and so on is going to help them when they get older. Um, this is something that they carry on no matter what age they are and in, in, in their life and with their own children and so on and so forth. And this may also inspire some children to even get into the psychological field or the sociology field. Um, I think this is a wonderful program. Thank you. Tamara. 
Um, I have a couple questions. Um, so what type of mental health professionals are we looking at um, having in through this program? Yeah, so the, so the mental health professionals that would be employed would be um, through ACRP and they would be <clears throat> uh, bachelor's level mental health workers. Uh, same, uh, same category as like TSS, they call them BHTs now. Um, the, the biggest thing that I think that, that stands out to me about ACRP is that uh, they're also able to do the specific training for skill streaming, coping cats, CBITs, and uh, not aggression replacement training because that comes directly through a company. Um, but we could, we could also provide that. Yes, and a lot of the new um, girls that were recently hired also. Yeah, yeah, they uh, a lot. So, so from ACRP's perspective, they're going to hire bachelor's level um, uh, folks that have that that are able that they train. But uh, I think the uh, Kelly, you said you mentioned that they, they have a teaching certificate. So, so they're going to have a bachelor's degree. It's going to vary a little bit from person to person. Can you just describe like what do they do? Like I don't think I understand what they do. Yeah. Can you so, just tell us that. Yeah. So. Uh, so they do check in, check out. They do check in in the in the morning, and then they do check out in the afternoon. But throughout the day, they're providing these interventions. They're doing the coping cat groups. They're doing the social skills groups. They're doing during the CBITs time. groups. They're doing. Uh, say that again. During yeah. wind time. Yeah. Because that's and, what the child needs. And then that's the so during their wind time, that's that's where they get that. But that um, and those wind times are flexed throughout the course of the day. So that, that takes probably eighty. 90 percent of their day um they're also like right now at ben franklin um our kindergartners are i'm sorry Here's the microphone please oh okay uh our kindergartners um are children that during the pandemic maybe did not participate in any early childhood um programming and so they are having a little bit more of a difficult time with some social skills and so um, the ACRP is going into kindergarten and teachers are identifying areas of need and they're um, teaching uh, skill streaming lessons to kindergarten right now. So that's also part of their day. Um, they go in and they can do like a time on task for a student or just some general observation that maybe is needed. They can work with school psychs for, for some of that. Yes. So basically the screening, the screening information that is gathered three times a year from the teachers is used, those data are used to plug kids into specific interventions. One of the questions on the screener is essentially, does the kid seem depressed or anxious? Well, if that kid is rated highly or the kids that are kids that are rated highly on that screener, then they are plugged into probably coping cats because that's an anxiety, anti-anxiety kind of um manualized intervention all of these are evidence-based if many of them have been around for two or three decades and they're all scripted so someone with a bachelor's degree with appropriate supervision and training could very easily implement these because it's scripted in a way that really doesn't leave a whole lot of room for them to do whatever they want to do and so they're doing those in small group occasionally one-on-one uh, -on -one, but it's largely in small groups you're getting a, you're getting a small group of kids all at once using an intervention that's specific to their identified need. And uh, just to add on to that, the, the supervision that's provided for these mental health workers from ACRP, uh, there are two, and they're both um, BCBAs. Yeah. What is, what's a BCBA? Uh, certified Behavior Analyst. Oh. <clears throat> um, some of them might even be licensed for child Not yeah. necessarily, but some yeah. of them might have that additional credential. Yes. So that means are all the kids in the class yes. just the screen. Okay. Teacher fills it out on every kid three times. Yeah, so it's not like a it's not like a student like the students are given a questionnaire. It's it's really just the teacher that's that's rating. Yeah. Tammy, your hands back up. Yes. Um I think then another benefit of us identifying these children, uh, the fact that a lot of them wouldn't be able to get these services another any other way. Um, so I think that's and also something we should take into consideration. So and, and the group meets one time a week. 
just not meeting every day. Um, so a child, for instance, is still getting what they need in the area of literacy during the wind time or math, um, but then they're getting what they need for behavior as well once a week. And Mr. Hart, I, I think um, what Ms. Blank said went on, uh, under um, undervalued or underestimated the amount of access they need and rather kids missing school, going out, coming back in, miss, I mean, we should be providing services in school. So what she said, I, I truly support. I think she's absolutely spot on because what we had happen before we got here as a team, um, those supports weren't done in school. And the, the, the train of thought in this district was they should go outside and get these services. And then the kids would or wouldn't. And then we didn't know what happened to them or they missed whole day of school. So eliminating barriers, providing access in the school is the right thing to do to get these kids where I think they need to be in the support they need. It seems like the intervention is happening at, at a less, less dire event so that you can you can head off these problems and, and nudge these kids back to stable. Yeah, it's more proactive than reactive. Yeah. And, and that's what and we so, want to do. So for me to take my child and take him to a psychologist, there has to be like nine bad things happen. Um, whereas, whereas every day you can nudge this kid back in the line. So um, Tamara, you, your hands up, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I love this program, but I'm worried about our junior and senior high students. Um, if we have that big of a need at a school with 400 students, what about the high school that has maybe double that? So I guess my question to, I have a question for Dr. Rungi, is there a program like this? I mean, this is very low level um, juvenile, I guess, if you will. Um, is there, are there similar evidence-based programs that we could be doing in the middle and high school? The short answer is you can do the exact same thing at the high school level. So just because all of those interventions, coping cat, skill streaming, um, uh, aggression replacement therapy, and many others are appropriate for that age range as well. And, and just to add in here, the, the, the rationale as to why not the high school just yet. So we would have someone at the junior, we would have someone at the junior high, but at the high school, what my thought was, was um, we haven't started PBIS yet at the high school. And I almost think that in order for us to start the tier two and tier three interventions, we almost have to build out that tier one first uh, and build the core with doing PBIS there. So I think that's a, I think that's our first goal. And I think down the road, I think once we can get a year, you know, or so of implementing, you know, a core program at, with PBIS there, I think then we could consider it maybe at that time. And I would add, um, <clears throat> depending how well we can work with the IU and get a 21st century grant, if we were able to get a 21st century grant where we can provide for summer tutoring, that would free up $340,000 of vestry funds. So I could be able to find additional funds. I, they're next on the list. So no pressure, uh, Dr. Matson <laughs> or Ms. Sheasley. Um, but but yeah, that's what I meant about how we can move money around possibly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yep. And that's my concern. You're absolutely right. Yes, ma'am. of asking you to imagine what these problems are. And I hear you describing a crisis and you're talking about kindergarten students and whatnot. What type of, you don't want to, you don't want to over-label children with this, but do we have fighting? Do we have fear? Do we have crime? Do we have um, um, toilet training skill problems? Or what the heck are you talking yes. about here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Madam Vice President, I, I would let everyone else speak. Uh, we have all those issues, but the only thing I think I see more than ever now is the side effects of social media <clears throat> and the impact of it's having on kids um, and how they can need to help and disconnect with that and deal with their anxieties. Uh, right now, when we talk about the learning loss, no one's talking about the loss of structure that happened when school shut down. And we're doing everything we can to keep schools open, but all those things are compiling into one uh, big disaster heading towards public education. Now, we've done a good job with the supports we have in place. Um, what the board charged me with was, well, what would you do to add to it, to strengthen it? And that's what we're bringing forward. But you're absolutely right, Madam Vice President. What concerns me is in two years, this safety net 
could be removed from students. So you're, you're, it's a very valid point. Well, well, thank you. What percentage of funding do you have to do after this? And I'm not, I'm not, I, I need to hear some numbers mm -hmm. here. So, because, yeah. So based on our SRSS, the number is about 20%. It's been a little bit lower. Uh, we've actually had at Ben Franklin, since we've been tracking this, we've actually had less students at risk despite the pandemic, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, but we have, it's, it's typically about 20%. I think even from the research from NASP, it says one in five children or adolescents will experience mental health problems during their school years. And um, so, so that number is about 20%. It's just just in real quick, the 20 percent is coming in to our system. Is that 20 percent consistent then from K to five? Yeah, I think it is pretty consistent. When we look at our SRSS numbers by grade, uh, it does remain pretty consistent by grade. This year's there there is a little bit of a difference this year in kindergarten. We have had higher amounts in kindergarten this year, and I don't know that I mean, I, we could speculate that that's due to the pandemic, but you, you, yeah, you, that, we just don't we just don't know that. I think Kelly could probably speak better. Yeah. Than... You want to chime in, Mr. Springer? Just I think just like I said, um, because they didn't have a lot of early. Um, well, just examples of the behavior. I mean, actually, do you have kids biting other kids? Do you have kids that are coming in? The I have children biting other children, biting adults, um, punching. Adults, um, lack of coping skills, lack of coping skills, even aggression, even, oh, my goodness, yes. adults, mm -hmm. my students aren't reflected in the data at Horace Mann, but we had students more likely to want to kill themselves this year than ever before. We don't have any SRSS data yet. Well, did they tell you that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They say, I want to kill myself. Yeah. Oh, yes. And and I think the other thing that stands out, and too, to me. They have a plan, which is even more terrifying this one at this have a plan recently. So, I mean, it's very real. Ours it, is more underlining at Horace, and it's not as loud. But they, it is sure. there. I think if you asked me why, uh, why now more than ever, I think we're also experiencing the very real effects of, you know, many students that had, so, so even though we're seeing less students identified as risk uh, at Ben Franklin, what we are seeing is that those students that are tier three are much more significant than they were in the past. And here's, here's one of the reasons why. Because of staffing issues, some of our like third party agencies, like the, the places that would staff TSSs or BSEs are no longer able to staff those positions. So if there was a student before last year or year before that had a TSS that was working with them one on one, a lot of those positions are no longer being filled. So that, that student who was used to having someone with them, you know, helping support their needs, no longer there. And and I think that has a real, I know the principals have definitely seen that. That has a very real effect. And you know, with the little ones, they're not able to communicate their feelings. And so they will become physical combative. Whereas four or five, they can have a little bit more self-control. Um, but that's where the internalizing behaviors are, are happening. And so I think that once we start to do that's okay. And I, I would say we're seeing more of the external behaviors where, where I'm dealing with them. I've, I've had the students with the name calling the language. The language that I'm hearing coming out of these little guys is, I mean, the, before this year, I probably never heard the F word out of their mouth. But now this year, I, I know there's at least 12 write-ups with that about them swearing in class and using that word with the whole class hearing it and those kinds of things. So we're working on strategies to help them with those kinds of skills and that kind of thing. It's something we started with IUP uh, prior to the pandemic with Dr. McLaughlin was we were running these groups at Eisenhower, uh, but the pandemic shut them down. I'm hoping that she will contact me. We're going to do that again. Yeah, she's supposed to. Okay. <laughs> we're going to do that again, but we were seeing success with that. We were seeing success with them um, learning these skills, and we were seeing that reflected in the class of even in the short few months that we had done it. And I had the pleasure of running a group where we worked with external skills with the kids that were being more, it's, it's a lot of verbal stuff with the fourth and fifth graders that I'm dealing with. And I saw some, I was running some of the groups with Mrs. Obarka. We would, we would take turns doing it, and we were able to see success with these kids learning how to rephrase their language, how to re, how to re, um, define their feelings, how to not just go to the name calling. Name calling is another thing um, that we get, we get a lot of right now um, because it's an easy way. It's an easy way to label. It's an easy way to be out. You know what I mean? To say I just meant them instead of getting into the feelings. Um, we also had two girls drama, as I call it, going on. Um, where, you know, the, the, the kind of stuff was beginning to develop, but we 
we were trying to nip that in the bud um, so that when they got to the junior high, they weren't forming those cliques and things in the proverbial mean girl movie, things like that. So those are some of the things I can speak to of what we were dealing with and what we continue to deal with and that we want to continue to deal with. Um, and um, so what do you principles agree just to come amplify too? Well, and as I was going to say, I, I have, well? yeah, I have some, I have some young, I have some students like this year. We, we had one who just ran out of the building the other day. You know, we have things like that going on that I've never had going on before. Yeah, and Madam Vice President, just to answer your question, the secondary level, the junior high, just to give an example, like we've had, you know, multiple kids, not just an isolated incident where we've had a student, like you say, you're cursing, cursing at administration, dropping, you know, F-bombs at administration. And we don't take that personal. Like we, when we, when we call the parent and say, look, like, like we know they're not angry with us. Like they don't come in here angry at Dr. Mimic or myself or the counselors. Like when you have a student, a child, you know, verbally, you know, dropping f bombs, cursing that at an administrator. We know there's underlying issues there, and you know, of course, we follow the handbook. And when there's times there's got to be, you know, detentions or suspensions. You know, we do accordingly. But you know, we we don't, that doesn't want to be our you know number one go to. We want to find out what's the root cause. Again, we have all good kids in this district. No kids, uh, no kids are ever born um angry or upset. Like they're all good kids. There's something going on there. So our initial response to that would be to de-escalate, calm down, get the counselors involved, get on the phone with the parent. We found a lot of success bringing the parent in, having face-to-face -face meetings or virtual meetings with the parent, guidance counselor, talking about the resources we can do, whether it's community-based counseling um, or, or other interventions. But Ms. Leeper, you make a great point. Uh, and, you know, I, we've been working with Mr. Zahorchek, uh, getting deeper into uh, our stage of the junior high with PBIS, uh, we we're, we're in that second phase, looking at tier two interventions. And, you know, part of this will be getting the support, whether it's ACRP, you know, the support, our guidance counselors, again, are doing a great job, um, you know, helping us and supporting our kids. But this is just another layer to, like you mentioned, the help with these behaviors, um, with some tier two, tier three interventions. We, we started the screeners at the junior high phase one of those screeners. We're not perfect. We're growing. We're trying to get better. And this is a new for us. Um, but we're working towards getting to where, you know, Mr. Banny did at Ben Franklin and what the elementary, other elementary schools are doing as well. Cause we, we, we hear you and we understand your concern and we do want to bring that to the junior high and take that to the next level. But just to your answer question, uh, that, that is the kind of the behaviors that we're seeing, um, eloping, leaving the classroom, walking out of the classroom. Uh, but again, we want to deescalate. We want to talk to these kids and let them know that we, we love them. We care for them. And it's not always going to be perfect. And we're, you know, we're going to have some, some confrontation, but you know, the stance that we're taking is okay, what's causing this. Why are you that angry? Cause let's all be honest. No one wait again, no one wakes up in the morning saying, I want to go curse out my principal today. No one, no one does that or plans to do that. And we know that we understand that. And we want to do whatever we can to, to, to take care of these kids. So sorry, the long, long winded answer with the, uh, this after. Tom, I have a question, and I'm not sure whether it's appropriate for Tim or Justin or Mike. But since I was on the board, there was there seemed to be some sort of a line between providing whatever the supports were that the students might need, albeit in the past maybe they were not adequate, and actual counseling that a psychiatrist or a psychologist would need to do. Number one, does that line still exist in a school system? And if so, where is that line? Because it seems that as we, you know, you, you talk about layer tier one, and then you we're now tier two, and we're looking at tier three. And are we getting close to that line? Or is that line going to move? Um, I, I just, I, I'm a little confused if, if the three of you can help me out on that. So, so I think I can answer that, but, um, Tim, Tim can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, but, <laughs> um, but what I would say is that, that, that line. So when we do that screener, we identify kids that we might need to provide interventions for. We provide those interventions at a tier two and we're still collecting data on those students. We meet every two weeks in, in, at Ben Franklin. We talk about those students 
if they're making progress and they're doing really well, we're looking at how do we fade them and how do we get them to start managing their behavior on their own? But if they're not doing well, then we're saying, okay, what is it now that we do next? And then we'd be looking at more individualized, more intensive, um, uh, more intensive counseling. And then I would say at that point, there's my, there's my line. And I'm saying if we're providing individualized supports through our ACRP counselor, and that's still not be, being effective as we're still collecting that data, then I think that's the point where we as a team, we decide, look, we've, we need to seek outside supports because what we're doing isn't, isn't being effective. Tim, correct correct that if I'm wrong. Correction, just a little adding a little bit to that. Typically that line is demarcated by a mental health or psychiatric diagnosis. And that is almost always made by a medical professional or a licensed psychologist. So a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a licensed professional counselor. And typically one of the key features of a mental health diagnosis is in part, this is just one of many, but the, one of the main features is the behaviors or symptoms are present for six or more months and they affect home, school, work, community living. And so what we're talking about is a kid who's, sorry, swearing at you using the F-bomb, says it once or twice, as bad as those may be, that's not a chronic issue that's occurring for six months or longer. If that kid continues to behave that way after six months, then you might be looking at something that's much more serious, and there's where your line might be where they need to seek outside professional assistance. And I, and I understand your explanation using the f-bomb as an example mm -hmm. but i heard krista and either of you two say something about kids talk about possible suicide and they have a plan yep. absolutely at that point in time those are the kind of lines that i was sort of looking at at what point when a kid comes in and says <laughs> you know tomorrow afternoon here's the plan end of story the, yeah, that, that's the, the, the district is putting they have a plan in place. They're updating that plan based upon some um, assistance from one of my colleagues, Dr. Mark McGowan, who specializes in violence risk assessment. Um, so the district does have a plan. They're revisiting it, given the tragic events that occurred in Michigan, want to make sure that everything's in line, that it should that should be there. But yeah, those those very serious and uh, acute situations are addressed by professionals. You're not going to have someone with a bachelor's degree doing a suicide risk assessment. No way. You would never have that happen. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Ma Dr. McMasters is on. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Angela. Yeah, I just wanted to add that just like Dr. Rongi said about the severity of cases that would get to that point where it would be something diagnosable, our goal is to have evidence-based programs in place so that we could hopefully prevent students from getting to that place where they don't have the coping strategies that it would become clinically significant. So like, for example, I'm doing coping cat with um, four different students right now. And a large part of our conversation is just talking about anxiety and recognizing it. And it's like these light bulbs are going off. Like I've never had this conversation with an adult before about what that feels like. So ultimately the goal is that we're providing that within that triangle so that for certain we're catching students who do have significant mental health needs that require substantial intervention and that's where we would involve crisis and hopefully recognize any kind of warning signs leading up to that um, i've been a school psychologist now for about 17 years and suicide threats have happened in every position i've been in and in every building i've been in and certainly it's a cry for help and we have to take those very seriously. So our goal in all of this is to really teach kids the skills that they need so that if they get to that place, we've, we've warded it off ahead of time. Um, so I just wanted to share that part of it is that most of these kids, we, would, we want to cast the net wide enough that it's not getting to that clinically significant range, that there's enough of a caseload to have a licensed psychologist necessarily um, providing that service in the schools. And sometimes it's not the best place. And Dr. Rungi, um, you can chime in on this as well. Depending on what the student's receiving services for, it's hard for students sometimes to transition back to a school setting depending on what they're in therapy for. Um, so there's just some different things to consider there. A Angela, this is Walter. Thank you for that. I certainly support the, you know, this all those prevention or um, um, 
positive behavioral that you're trying to do for the social emotional skill sets that these kids need that there's no question about that my question was what happens you know when when it goes beyond that and 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 then what then what do we do or what is our proper role at that point really is, is my concern. absolutely and i think one of our goals is to communicate with the families that we're working with um so that if we get to that point we try to start having those conversations and have lists of community resources which i, I know um, many of them have long wait periods so we have our sap process to make referrals there's school-based counseling uh, we have our school counselors, and I do believe it's kind of like even our hospitals right now that the mental health professionals are triaging and treating the most critical cases as they they come up. So we do have other layers, so kids aren't going without. It's just making sure that we aren't having that conversation too little too late. I mean, it should be an ongoing conversation with families from the minute we recognize a risk. And we do have a school-based um, mental health program through the Community Guidance Center where um, students um, actually receive counseling from certified therapists from the Guidance Center with them. And those students are usually, um, there's a process that they go through, the, the school counselor will fill out a form per the parent's request, then they go to the Guidance Center and they, they take care, of, they get an evaluation and then they, they refer them back for the therapy. So there, that, this, the outside agencies become the, the next level. I look at this as what we're doing with the tier two and tier three is it, there's skills that we can teach. Um, when you move to the, the outside agencies and stuff, you're moving towards things that are more therapeutic and more mental health based and medication based possibly and things like that. So what we're, what we're doing, right, we, we go right up to that to that line, so to speak, Mr. Shroves, where we're teaching the skills, we're giving them the, this, the, 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 the strategies and those kinds of things. But when, it, when they go over that line or they move towards that area where they need the medications and those, that's when we bring in those other programs that we have available. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at. Okay. What, what, what is the, the overall structure and is there that line and, and what do we do when we yeah. get to that line? And you've answered the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, in summation, I think the committee supports this motion move. Um, I think uh, all of us would like to see it extended to the high school and the secondary as quickly as you can get it there. Um, assuming you can find qualified people and Julia can find the money. So Julia could, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> but, but assuming Tom and I, I mean, um, will it, do you have plans to send it or do you have to send it to the I would go ahead and make this motion since it's only affecting the essence of funds that we would take it straight to the board. And if you want, if you want to take it to, if you want to take it to finance, you could do that. Yeah, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, Madam Vice President, Mr. Harley, Mr. President, I would just like to get the contract, bring it to the board for approval since for this year and next year we're using essence funds. And then once we get beyond that year, bring it back to all the committees and have discussion about where we are budget wise for right now. If the board is comfortable with it, I have the ESSER funds, we can pay for it. I don't need any more approval other than the formal ratification, which could be on January 10th or 24th, whatever is easiest for the board and most conducive. Well, we'll take it back and um, policy and personnel committee next Monday night. So we, I think we're going to talk about third time. Sure. We're going to talk about um, the, um, how high you can raise the taxes. Yep, the index. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. And then we can do it. As I said, my main concern. Is that we have to figure out from a, a projection projections on down the line for the next five years or so. You ought to know in three years whether this is working. If it's not working, then we, you know what's we'll going But it, it does seem to me that it's it's really dangerous. If somebody said you you start something and then it's not funded and the kids let you know pick stuff that doesn't know where to go. Doesn't have anybody to talk to that can be offer sensible solutions. So. No, I don't want to. I, I think we've got to figure out how you're going to pay for this going forward, assuming it works. Right. Yes, ma'am. That I, would be my only concern at this point. Well, the, we've had some. We've had some experience with Ben Franklin, but it working, and so that's why we're having enough confidence to move ahead with it across. The well, I think it comes down to efficiency, efficiency. You, you're asking for four, you know, in a typical negotiation. Well, maybe we'll give you two. I mean, I, yes, I'm not because there's a lot of needs, and I think this one is primary. 
And we'll see where we're at a year from now. Uh, again, this is not just one thing in isolation. This is a whole system working in unison, our whole MTSS model going together. Like, for example, uh, when we're just talking about one facet, but you also have our school psych GAs that are working, having small groups, our, our school psychs are doing small groups, our counselors, this is a part of that recipe, and maybe we'll need less of it when come time, but yes, you know, our job is not to scare you about the cost, our job is to be honest about the cost. I'm, I'm not scared about cost, I just, but, but I want to know where we're going to, because these costs are just like anything else, that they're like compounding interest, they keep compounding. Yes, so. I agree. But I think what we're going to need on major, I call this a major initiative. I don't know, Tom, if you say it that way, but I yeah. do. Yeah, I see I it as a major initiative, and it's got a major initiative price tag on it. Yes, it does. Um, so I, what I would be looking for as a board member is real data about exactly, you know, this many problems in this, none of this, a lot of kids are coming in. Yeah. Because you could have a parent say, look, you're saying my kid can't read, and if there's all kinds of my kid can't read. Yep, I get it. We'll, we'll present the data. We'll monitor. I don't normal and what you're really working against. And normal, there's no longer much normal. I think that's a, I, a I, very fair request. Julia, I think that's also helpful because I think when we talk too much in generalities, then the public, who effectively at some point has to chip in and pay part or all of this bill, if they understand the seriousness of it, then I think that most people would be willing to go along with it. Um, to talk in too much in generalities, I don't think actually sells that story or tells that story or sells that program. So I, I, I think that's the other reason why uh, to, to help get the word out. Can I say one more thing? One of the things, Justin, you mentioned is the importance of PBIS. It works. It's been around for almost two decades, maybe. It was down south, and I had really hard schools down south, and that's what we counted on. We didn't have behavioral specialists. But, like, I do think that's so important is that we're running that effectively. We're, we're watching it. And if you're saying that the high school needs it, we get it in there. It works in high schools. It works in middle schools. So it's a proven program, and we have to do that, too. And those are the things we did bring in. So I think that those are the other pieces that we want to keep bolstering as we go. Because that'll also help offset the cost if we're doing that correctly, too. So, Tom, just one more thing, just to say, um, and there's certainly more experts around the table than I am on this, but I think to the average person out there who's on social media and keeps in touch with the news and is not addicted to social, and I don't know how you measure addiction. I mean, we haven't, Dr. Ernie, you didn't talk about that as a problem, how young kids can get addicted. They all pop around these phones. Um, I don't know what they're looking at um, or what's affecting them, but. Uh, I think to the average person, they read about the school shooting and they're like, what is going on in this country? But nothing, you know, we don't seem to ever find out what the habits of the person were and the cases are all hushed up because they're juveniles. So I don't think people really know. Um, average people who are going to work, paying the bills, um, trying to trying to get their kids raised properly and know exactly and don't have time to, to, to be in depth the way the academics do. So, you know, <clears throat> This program that you refer to, you said it's you didn't have it in some yeah, well, You all think it's huge. I'm just you don't even know about it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's the important So thing. I don't know how you communicate that. Uh, I think what sorts of information that might be helpful, obviously, with the schools that are currently implementing PBI, I think you need to update it, but the secondary school, people like your Pennsylvania Youth Survey data, your case data, it's done every odd year. Yeah, this year. It's happening yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's happening this year. But anyhow, that, that'll, because you can look at launch, not you, but maybe, you know, collectively. Some information could be gathered and, and shared with with these yes. That you can look at longitudinally how uh, suicide ideation, suicidal ideation has changed in this district. The, the public reports are by county, but each school district gets its own tailored report specific to its data. So I can get as a, as a citizen, I can get Indiana County data, but I can't get Indiana area school district. Your administrators have that, um, and you can look at that kind of stuff for. On substance abuse, and it breaks it down by different types of drugs. I mean, you can look at it. There's actually too much data, but maybe just a thumbnail sketch or a 30,000 foot level view of some of that data will give you and this community an idea as to just where this community really is in terms of its mental health needs. So you might be a little surprised in a negative way. Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, I was surprised when I sat on the university board. Um, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I actually said this can't be true, but they, the, the freshman survey, and it was different between the men and the women, but they said that 
something like 18% of the freshman class admitted to girls had it. 18 years old, and I, this was years ago, and I thought to myself, like, that was, but it's since. So your 18% statistically is very close to the 20% you're yeah, talking I know. about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to gauge this. Yeah. Joey, I think that we recognize the communication piece also, and the elementary team at least is going to really focus on some of the big picture and programming things that we are doing. Like our last newsletter focused on PBIS. Yeah, so we'll have a newsletter that will focus on SEL, what yeah. we're doing in that area for programming. We will focus in, we can even focus in on um, you know, what you're going to be voting on shortly, just again, communicate with our community and our families, you know, what the things that we are doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Can we move on? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to point out that it's we're an hour and five minutes. I will, I will pick it up. And, uh, and Julia is giving me a hard time if we go five minutes. I will pick it up. I <laughs> Uh, we, can, we can blame it in part on her because she had a long talk there. Well, you did too. So. Um, so next on ahead. next on the list, Mr. Harley, we have two we have two special guests here from the IU um, twenty eight. We have uh, Dr. Bridget Matson, the executive director, and Miss Andrew Sheesley, who will take the roles and assume most of the duties of uh, Kathy Monko and uh, her new role at the IU. And what they're here tonight is to talk to you about the twenty first century grant. I'm asking for permission to allow us to. Um, allow the IU to include us in their grant uh, to provide some after school programming and summer programming here in the near future if we're accepted. When you look at it, um, the grant requirements, I think PD requires, and I'll defer to Andrea and uh, Dr. Matson. I think the PD requires a minimum of 12 to 15 hours um, per week involved in the program. And I think you're looking at anywhere between 36 weeks of after school programming and about between 400 to 500 hours of after school programming so it's a combination of tutoring uh, a, con uh, a combination of some fun and some games and connecting but also feeding kids after lunch so you know hunger and homelessness is a real issue uh, across this country so what we're really going to do is give the floor to uh, andrea and give the floor to bridget and say look tell us a little bit more about the grant give us some assurance that you have the skill set capacity to write the grant and and then have any just any questions the board may have if that's okay with you well first of all i just want to thank provide us with this opportunity to provide service for all of you. Um, I am here to assure you that we are uh, planning to include Indiana in the in the grant. Uh, we will be writing the grant as well as managing that grant and doing all the back end and work for you um, on behalf of that. And it really is like uh, Mr. Vukovic spoke about that this is an opportunity to, to create a community learning center uh, for you know, academic programming that happens uh, during non-school hours is really to help students not only reach the standards of all the core subjects, but also to offer, you know, enrichment opportunities as well. Um, with that being said, I'll pass it on to Andrea, and she can tell you a little bit more, speak a little more in depth about the actual grant, and uh, then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have as well. The goals of this after school program is to provide STEM, STEAM activities for children in the elementary and middle school levels. Our, our program is to increase reading, math, and science skills by utilizing uh, support uh, through activities such as uh, math, you know, science, engineering, music, technology, and of course academic supports. As Mr. Rukovic said, um, they'll be providing school meal or school snacks after school. Um, summer mills in the summertime, uh, transportation to and from uh, back home and when those children stay. Of course, homework help uh, is provided and uh, support those students that need uh, remedial educational support. There's also a part of the program that asks for parent involvement. So having a parent, excuse me, a parent board um, is also required and then there's family engagement, so there's activities planned such as you know, game night, movie nights, those types of things with the families. Um, and again, like I said, our target is middle school and elementary age children. Does anyone have any questions for me? Um, how does this um, uh, interface with our with our last summer program? 
what it could do is we could work together and either enhance it or eventually replace it. This grant is much more sustainable and, long, and uh, longer caring than compared to ESSER's fund. So what we could do hypothetically is, depending on how we work the grant, they can do that after school prep or during the school year. We could do one more year with ESSER's funds for summer camp, and then it could take over. Or there's a lot of those details that need worked out. I'd like to see them take over the, uh, um, the summer school program just to free up $320,000 of ESSER's funds that we can use elsewhere. So it's one of those things that's going to be done with us. The only thing I would recommend to this committee, um, and the IU has been great to work with, make sure we have a voice in this because I don't know if I'd like to partner outside with an outside agency. I'd like to see what we could do in-house with some of our staff members to provide some of these services. You could partner with like, um, what's that place in Blairsville? Um, oh my God. Um, Evergreen. Evergreen. You could partner with a, an institute like Evergreen or something like that. I rather stick internally because I think there's a discernible difference between homework help and tutoring. I think they're two different things and people often confuse them and make them the one. So I'd really like to look if we're going to do this, really identifying weaknesses of kids and filling those gaps so they can move on to next grade level ready and prepared. So that's what we'd like to work on. But those are details that need to be worked out. We have the option of partnering with an evergreen outside agency or doing something internally. I'm probably going to advocate that we look in-house. The issue with that be is would we have staff who's willing to work that after school? And that's something we have to figure out and we're not there. Bridget, um, Andrew, did I speak at all about that as being an option? The only thing I can say as far as that, I mean, we can tailor the grant uh, you know, the best that we can as far as to whatever we need the needs of the district. It is a competitive grant, though. So just to, in full transparency, um, that being said, you know, we have been awarded these grants in the past. We will be a, pursuing it in a very similar fashion in hopes that we are the recipients again, but it, it is a competitive grant. So there is that risk that, you know, it may not come through. Um, I do feel though that uh, this has been in place. Uh, this is actually cohort 11. So there have been 10 cohorts behind it. And uh, so I can't see why they wouldn't continue to fund this. Uh, the programs that we have been doing with the districts uh, within the IU have been very successful, well received, well attended. Uh, they, they seem some really great results out of that. So, um, and there is no one size fits all. You know, some of them look uh, look differently depending on you know how the district decides to go about putting that all together. And this is also another opportunity where we can partner with IUP. I mean, there's a lot of conversations that need to happen. We're just not there yet. Right now, we're seeking assurances that they can write it, insurance that will be part of it, and then your approval for them to go ahead and include us if that's okay. So, their ability to write it and whatever else. You're only looking for the committee to approve pursuing this down the road. There. Yes, usually the board asks us for any grant um, okay. that we're going to be a part of, either write our own or be a part of that we have permission. So, so you'll make a recommendation, Tom, to the board, and then we'll we'll have a motion to approve it. Is that right? Yes, sir. Does it does, does it need to be approved by the board? That, that yep, it does. Okay. Well, anytime so, with grants, we usually seek board approval. So I'd like to be ratified. Uh, it's a rather relatively quick motion, yep. and there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But right now, we're just seeking approval to be a part of the writing process. Okay. Any objection from the committee? Hearing none. Okay. Okay. Let's go get the money. <laughs> no pressure, right, Dr. Manson? Uh, next on the list, sir, what we have um, to bring your attention, we're not ready to ratify or bring it forward to the board, but eventually it will come forward to the board. We are working uh, on your behalf uh, to try to develop an MOU between us and the IAEA on building substitutes. Um, you charge us with that responsibility. So we've been working with the IE, IAEA to try to get this done and get things where we think we're competitive, but also put in a position where we can keep our classroom safe. As we told you from day one, one of the biggest hurdles or bears we're going to have is the lack of qualified substitutes to keep our schools and keep our doors open. As you saw today, or may have saw today or yesterday, Pittsburgh had to shut down because of staffing issues. This is a step in the right direction to try to keep us open. We are working at MOU. It's not complete, sir. I'm hopeful it'll be done by January 10th. If it is, I'll bring it forward to Ms. Cinda's committee to review it next Monday. If not, I'll have to punt till January 24th. They'd be hired through Kelly Services. They can apply through them as well as get benefits through them if they so choose. No step or seniority would be applied to this role. The MOU would be good for one year. Uh, I don't see any difficulty in renewing it the following year with the association. But again, what we're doing here is allocating $320,000 investor funds to get us the subs there. So that money... Um, that we had has now been allocated for all these other needs that we have. And we want to be upfront with you on that. But again, this is reflective of the need. It's also reflective of what you asked us to do. And we're, at, we're seeking approval if the MOU gets developed in time. Any objection? Okay, bring it. Let's go. 
Um, next on the list, this is something you do not have to do, but it's something we are respectfully requesting to do. Again, be using ESSER funds to pay for this expense, about $7,800. We're looking at a partnership in three different areas. One, a pill course for 12 of us to take, uh, which will focus on leadership and a job vetted project. Um, and we really want to get good at what we're doing. And, and the objective is really le leadership coaching and building team and unity um, through the K-12 that will empower our school district to operate efficiently and effectively. Um, coaching for administration, we think that's important to provide some support, ongoing coaching for administration with some of the challenges they're facing. So four people will be up to $1,400. And then I think it's time we do a nice audit of our cyber programming, what we can do to really revamp that, have an internal look to uh, how we oversee the program, how we implement the program, what could be done uh, process-wise, procedure-wise, and then they'll provide us a written evaluation. We do not have to do this whatsoever, but this is something I thought was a, in the step in the right direction. You also could take this a la carte. You can come back and say, Mike, eh, I don't want you to do the pill course or the coaching for administration, but I would like to cyber audit. So you don't have to take them all in one, uh, in one big piece. You can take it in smaller chunks. It would be through use ESSERS, but this is primarily to do two roles, grow the capacity to leadership team, and then to audit our cyber program to make sure we have the right people in the right positions and the right supports going to that outside program. Because when Dr. Rungi talked about how this could be, um, how MTS can mitigate costs, one of the biggest costs we have out there is cyber schools. And we want to make sure that we're competitive and doing it right. Uh, because when you look at the consequences of a dropout or a kid fleeing the cyber school, they're enormous. Uh, I think one of the most broken laws in the Commonwealth is the cyber school law. I think it's been long ignored and overdue for a change, but it not happened as of yet. But I think if we can look at our program, strengthen our program, it would be beneficial for the board. But again, I have to be clear, you do not have to do this. We're respectfully requesting. Anything from the committee? I certainly think that this is a useful exercise, all of them. Um, I agree. Dr. Riggs nodding her head. Okay, so let's move it forward. I, I also assume that we have some funds allocated for professional development. This will be able to ESSERS too. Um, we're using the ESSERS funds. Yeah, it's a one-time fee, but yeah, we, we do want. have professional development. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go. Okay. Very good. Make it happen. Yep. All right, sir. Uh, next on the list, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. McElhaney, Mr. Heinrich, and um, I believe we have some coaches on the call. They are requesting some out-of-state trip um, uh, trips this upcoming spring, and as you know, our policy usually requires board approval, so we thought we'd give you the opportunity to talk about it. We included their letters to the board requesting that permission for the baseball team and the soccer team, and we just wanted to give them a platform. So, uh, Mr. McAlley, would you like to go first, or is that Mr. Heinrich? I, I can't recall. Sure. Mr. Heinrich, do you want to introduce um, our speakers, whoever's online? To, I know yeah. that one individual could not make the meeting. They were going to join remotely. Oh, I'm sorry. I have, uh, Mr. Harold Wilson and Mr. Dan Petroff are supposed to be here um, to discuss and uh, the, the trips and the benefit to the students and answer any questions the board may have. So um, are those gentlemen Mr. present? Uh, Mr. Wilson or Mr. Petroff, are you online with us, sir? Gentlemen? Yes, I'm here. This is Dan. Well, Mr. Petroff, this is Mr. Vukovic. We'll, we'll give you the floor, and we thank you for taking time out to join us this evening. Sorry we're getting to you a little bit later. Um, Mr. That's President okay. likes to talk a lot. You know, I apologize. That's okay. No problem. So, Dan, could you talk to us about the benefits, uh, what the, the highlights of the trip and the benefits uh, for the kids? Yeah, we're, we're looking to go Thursday, March. And I'm sorry if I'm wrong on these dates, but uh, I don't have them in front of me. It's like Thursday, March 17th, and come back Sunday, March, what would that be, 21 or 20, um, to Myrtle Beach. And every year we do it. It's a good learning experience for the kids. And um, I, we feel like it helps with bonding and, you know, team spirit, if you, for lack of a better word, especially in these days. Um, and obviously around here, the weather doesn't cooperate very well for baseball in the spring. So, you know, it gets us on the field together and we do other activities while we're there, you know, to do some team stuff, you know, other than baseball, you know, just to keep them, you know, we try to make them bond together and it always seems to work really well. Absolutely. And how many, how many kids go on the trip? We, we are taking, I'm just going to give you a round number, 17 to 20. We're not sure on one or two, three kids maybe. And, five coaches we have plenty of chaperone coaches for lack of a better word 
I guess the only thing we don't know 100% of what we're doing, and if you guys have a recommendation, we're fine with it. We don't know if we're going to fly yet or take a bus. Um, we haven't decided, you know, financially what we want to do yet. In the past, we have sure. flown. Sure. And what kind of where do, the money for this trip? This is all raised by boosters. Correct. One hundred percent raised by boosters. So no money comes out of the district budget at all. No, not at all. And I, I don't know if Harold's on here, but I, I know they're the same. It's all coming from their boosters as well. I can speak for him on that part. Sure. So, Mr. Hurley, I, I think the committee just has to decide if they feel comfortable uh, approving this. There's no local cost. I mean, right now, you see all the cancellation of flights. So I can't recommend they should fly or drive because I know one's longer, but I think they get there if they drove. That's something they'll have to decide. But we just want to bring it to the committee because – it's one of those things. We see what's happening in pandemic. We see how high the numbers are, but we also want to return to, return to some level of normalcy. So we thought we'd bring it to board because all out of state trips require board approval. So we thought we were bringing it to your attention. Um, as you can see, they've done a lot to fundraisers and handle the cost. Um, we're just bringing it to your consideration and see what you'd like to do. Well, um, take it to the board for approval. Um, details the coaches need to work out. Um, they've, they've done this in the past. Uh, as a former coach, I can attest to how important this is to get 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 the get the kids playing on a real field that isn't frozen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, really helps out. Um, I believe softball um, was in Tennessee last time when they got shut down um, and had to come back before they finished the trip. Yeah, right. I think yeah. our coaches do an amazing job following health and safety protocols. They've shown that over the last two years. Um, so I'm pr really proud of the work they've done. But if you're okay with it, then we'll put it on the agenda. We'll put it on the agenda. Mr. McElwain, did you want to say something? Uh, definitely support this measure for the reasons stated, but also knowing that the dates this far ahead will give students an opportunity to prepare academically to get their work for anything they're going to be missing in their classes. So that addresses all of our agenda items. If it's okay with you, Mr. Hart, I'll move into the non-agenda items. Absolutely. Um, the first one is just another FYI. A couple of years ago, you allowed us to author a pill course with Dr. Mark Greenberg out of Penn State. And pill course is? Um, Pennsylvania Inspired Leadership. It's our Act 80 hours. As administrators need a certain amount of hours. Great. You actually tell us what it means. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're just letting the board know that we're going to continue that work. You allowed us to do that. We're appreciative of it, and we're just going to continue spring as it, it's a good way to network, a good way to also get support from Dr. Greenberg and his group. Uh, as you know, Dr. Greenberg is the author and creator of PATHS and is on the board at CASEL as well. With that said, moving on to number two, um, you know, before I turn over to ICTC, we gave you these documents. And again, we talked in the area of social emotional learning trauma. But when you go through these building blocks, you also see about the need for high quality PPC, uh, career pathways, et cetera. And hopefully when you hear us talk, you'll start analyzing through these different types of uh, uh, scenarios and systems, because that's what we're really trying to build here is a comprehensive system. Part of that is the good work at ICTC. And this year they are implementing a new program in the area of diversified occupations. Randy, if you can click on the link under item number two, there's a presentation. If you could pull that up, we'd like to give the floor to the ICTC to talk about what that looks like and what they're going to be, what they are doing and how that complements the work we're doing in the area of career readiness and creating our learning uh, career pathways here at Indiana Area School District. Mike, for you, I'll allow you and your, your, uh, your colleague to introduce sure. yourself. Randy will navigate the presentation for okay. you. You can see on the screen, you could just tell him when to move forward each slide, okay? I appreciate the invitation, uh, Mr. Vukovic. Uh, Mr. McDermott couldn't be here, so he asked myself. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Worthington. I'm the principal at the Indiana uh, County Technology Center. And this is Keith McCracken. He is our co-op coordinator. Um, part of what we're here to discuss today is our work-based learning opportunities and wh what that means for our students, uh, not only of the Indiana Area School District, but the seven districts that we serve here in the county. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the importance of career and technical education in the career pathways, and I think this presentation tonight mm -hmm. will kind of help you understand what we've traditionally offered, um, what we've added, and where we hope to be here in the near future, and how that can benefit your students here at um, Indiana Area School District. So I think the important thing is to understand what we used to offer, or we still currently offer, but we had cooperative education, and that's been in place for a long time. And cooperative education programs, they combine structured classroom instruction with work-based learning directly related to that student's field of study. And if we go ahead and click to the next slide, um, there's some key characteristics to a good cooperative education program at uh, career. I don't know if you clicked it or not. Yes, see it. Okay. 
Um, career ex. Oh no, one more, please. <clears throat> there we go. Career exploration activities, student enrollment, and PD approved CTE program. So what does that mean? What that means is we, it's limited to who can participate in this program. The only students that can participate in the cooperative education program have to be enrolled, enrolled in the CTE and have to be enrolled in one of our capstone programs. And basically they have to be enrolled in that as almost a completer status. So our programs were traditionally run as three year programs, although a student can complete it in two years, it's an accelerated pace. But we're looking at a traditional three year enrollment in that program. And this would be the spring of their senior year that they could participate in that co-op experience. So you're limiting the amount of students that could participate in that program. They have to be a student in our building. And this will make a little more sense to you as I talk about some of the programs that we've added in the future. Uh, students receive pay for hours worked. Students' performance is monitored and evaluated both school-based and work-based learning experiences. Um, the employer-employee relationships fall under all state and federal guidelines. So they have to have all their clearances and, and everything that a student has to have is a uh, work permit. Um, they can only operate and, or work so many hours per week as provided by law. Co-op teacher completes training agreements and plans uh, with employers and students. Is there anything you'd like to add to the co-op experience? Well, just the overall management of that student while they're out of the building. Uh, the co-op coordinator is required to visit those students on site to ensure that they are indeed receiving instruction in what they went for. We don't want to put a kid in a welding shop and find out that he's painting. Uh, so we are required to go out and check those types of things. So just the overall administration. Make sure the experience is related to the And that it's valid. Um, so student requirements for eligibility, you'll see that it's it's a very stringent program. So they have to be a qualified senior, and I've talked about what that, that qualifies, and you have to be uh, basically a completer status in that program, um, and it's in their spring of their senior year. Students must have a B at the ICTC and maintain a C average or better at their sending school. So we really focus on that grade aspect of it. Um, we had some conversation as to maybe tweaking that policy to allow more involvement in that uh, in the near future. Uh, students must not have any discipline incidents, level two or higher, or suspensions for the current school year. So the school year that they're going to go out on co-op. And students must have no unexcused absences or violations of the IC ICTC attendance policy. So they have to come to school, they have to have good grades, and they have to have discipline in order to qualify for that program. Because we're sending a student out that represents the ICTC, your district, we don't want to uh, put in jeopardy those partnerships that we've established with that, that provider. So that takes us to the next program. And this is a brand new program at the ICTC called Diversified Occupations. It has its own SIP code, which means it's an approved program through PDE. There's a NACTI at the end of the program. Um, and real quick, yeah. uh, my uh, SIP code, I believe, if I recall correct, Classification Instructional Program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what the acronym stands yeah. for. That's all. Um, Mr. Hurley, you're welcome. So the diversified occupations program um, will assist Indiana public, public school students bridge that gap between high school and the world of work. So when we talk about these career pathways, every student has a different pathway. So how we all even reached where we are today, we all had different paths in getting there. Um, some of us do what we want to do right from the get-go. Some of us had a longer journey. Some of us had more diverse journeys. And what these opportunities allow is students to have different stopping points or get off points along that pathway to try different things <coughs> to make sure that is the right. right fit for them. And diversified occupations is one we're very excited with. Uh, currently, we're in the process of piloting this program. Um, it was just recently approved by PDE this year for us. And the timing of the approval probably wasn't conducive to running the program full bore this year um, because we got, was it late August? Yeah. So late August is when PDE approved the program, um, and it'll make a little more sense to you when we talk through the program as to why that wasn't conducive, because uh, part of the program, and it's a work-based learning opportunity, and all seniors in the county are eligible. So now we can reach every senior in the county. They don't have to attend the ICTC. They can stay enrolled in Indiana Area School District and participate in this program. But the, the catch-all is that they have to have 15 hours of work experience a week, and they have to be on track to graduate. So when you start thinking about schedules and how schedules are made, and, and secondary principals will tell you this, I put all these classes in a schedule. Now, how do I make room for the 15 hours of work in August when I already sent the schedules out and they're scheduled for these classes? Um, so we're in the process of piloting this program. We're trying to figure out what is the best way to serve the students. And to, to us, um, 
there are students that they want to attend ICTC. There are students who don't want to come to ICTC, but would like to participate in this program. They want to remain members of their sending school. Our co-op coordinator, he can manage the program. And what we need, I think, from the sending schools, and everybody has different resources. So when we, when we do things as far as the county, Indiana, you have a lot more resources, a lot more staff, um, and different things, even, even classes and curriculum opportunities for students maybe than some of the other area county schools. Um, and I know that uh, Mr. Brocious, I believe, uh, he's doing similar things in his program but you can't offer it under diversified occupations because you have to have the approved zip code and, and the program for PDE. Well, we can do that for you. We can partner with the Indiana Area School District and what Mr. Brocious is doing. And at the end of this program, there's a NACTI exam. Um, it's a paid work uh, program, so they can have up to 50, 15 hours is the minimum. And there's also a uh, component uh, as far as the soft skills and things that employers are looking for in students. There's a classroom component that could be taught through ICTC. Mr. McCracken would teach that. And currently what we're looking at, how we'd like to offer that would be, we believe we get the most and have the most flexibility if we would do it like through Google Classrooms or a virtual component. And, and the requirement is at least one 45 minute session a week of that class time throughout the school year. If we can do that virtually, that allows that opportunity then to have more flexibility in the, in the scheduling of the student at the high school to meet their cores or requirements for graduation. Um, eliminates the need for them to travel to ICTC weekly and maximizes the opportunities for students to be enrolled. And what really excites me about the program is I think a lot of times outside the box, and uh, I was a secondary principal at one of the setting schools before I was at ICTC. And one of the challenges we always faced in a smaller school setting is what do we do with like our GIEP kids or our gifted kids? Um, to me, gifted didn't mean more work. We we're supposed to be enriching them, finding their strength and providing them increased and better opportunities. This is a perfect example of how you could do that with a gifted student. If I have a, a student who's, and I'll use Mr. Harley as an example, who's interested in architecture, wants to be an architect. We don't have a program at the ICTC that is affiliated with engineering architecture. We may do things here at Indiana Area School District, but we're not offering them a degree in architecture. But they can participate in this program and they can work for Mr. Harley 15 hours a week and really see what it's like to work in an architectural firm before they ever would go on to post secondary or that career to make sure it's a good fit for them. Um, and now you're enriching that kid in that GIEP. I think you get a lot of buy-in from your parents and those students because you're providing an opportunity that they maybe didn't have before this program. And like I said, with that NOCTI and that SIP, that SIP code and all those other benefits that they get from that certification, um, I think it's a win for all the kids in the county and in the sending districts. And if we want to flip on, and I'm, I'm trying to condense this because I know I'm competing with the Steeler game. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll allow the opportunity for, um, for uh, questions at the end. So when we look at eligibility, if we go to the student eligibility requirements, it's all students in grade 12 are eligible. Uh, it's a full year course. We believe um, we would offer a credit with that. We haven't quite, and that's why I said we're piloting it now. We believe maybe one credit, but we're, we're open to suggestions there with the district and what your needs would be as far as the graduation requirements. A minimum of 15 hours a week uh, related experience per work must meet a minimum 45 minutes. We talked about that with the employability skills training, uh, complete the designated knock the exam at the end. And if you think about your graduation pathways, this could be an avenue for some students to graduate too. So now they've reached that senior year, what do I do? And part of your pathways are a reasonable assurance that they would complete a standardized or nationally recognized exam. And currently at the ICTC for those I don't know, probably last six or eight years, we've been in the mid 90% of all of our kids in our knock exams. So there's a reasonable assurance when we start a kid in a program that they're gonna complete the exam at the end of that. And this exam might fulfill that graduation requirement for some of your students. And there's no prerequisites required for this course. So like I said, they don't have to be enrolled at ICTC prior to doing this. Uh, they just have to be on track to get their high school diploma. So this is an avenue for a lot of students who maybe wake up that senior year. What am I going to do uh, moving forward? I don't really have a career plan or career goal. This might this might check that box for them, or at least give them opportunities to move forward. 
And then the other program, you want to add anything about the prescribed application? Well, just I did want to say when we when Mr. Harley, one of the things that might frighten you there is that, okay, I'm employing this kid, and then when it's over, he's going to file for employment. No, we, there is paperwork in place that ensures that that doesn't happen. Protects the employer. It protects the yeah. employer from those types of things. So Because they're agreeing to take the student in on educational terms, but they're also uh, obligated to pay them. So it's really not a employment situation as you would typically see it in that like if you had to let the kid go for some reason it didn't work out or at the end of the contract which is always june 1st they just walk over and file for an employment and say i was working at tom harley's they can't do that just there's a lot of semantics like that that, that go with running the program and the only other thing that i wanted to to, to say is that typically uh, the diversified occup occupations programs are not run out of CTEs. The reason that we um, really want to do it is that from time to time we'll get a either a business that doesn't quite fit what we're doing, okay, or a student who doesn't quite fit anything else. And we wanted to be able to serve them. Even at ICTC, we'll see students that would have been better served at times by being pulled out of whatever program they were in and put into a diversified occupations program. Let's say Cliff Pedroza calls me from uh, colonial and says, I need, I need somebody to sell parts at the counter. Okay? When you're just about occupation. The bank says, hey, there's no like training system for tellers that are coming out of hype. We can do but it's those kinds of things that fit really well. So the trick for us is finding the businesses and then finding the students. And sometimes you get that doesn't always balance out the scales. So that's the only other trick. And then the next program that we're excited about is a, a pre-apprenticeship program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're in the process, we're in the fledgling stages of, of getting involved in that process of, of maybe finding some providers. And basically it's a registered apprenticeships or innovative work-based online programs. And that's all through the Department of Labor. Um, we are currently working with two industry uh, partners trying to get this up and running and that is JWF uh, out of Johnstown in Indiana tool and die um, the pre-apprenticeship program if I had to equate it to something in the secondary world that you'd be very familiar with would be dual enrollment uh, when you think about dual enrollment what are you doing you're working towards that college uh, credits trying to shorten that time you're actually in the college save yourself some finances on on the front end pre-apprenticeships the same thing if you spend time in a pre-apprenticeship program, that time carries over into your apprenticeship when you're in that program. So you're actually reducing the amount of time that you're in that structured apprenticeship because there is a, a level of commitment involved with this program. This program, uh, you have to be enrolled in a CTE. Um, you would be in one of our capstone programs, one of our approved programs, and you're making a commitment to that, that provider or that person that is providing you that apprenticeship that you're going to spend typically four years. Yes. So it's typically a four year program that you're kind of locked in there. And what they're agreeing to do is they'll pay you why they do it. It's a work based learning. There's an educational component in the classroom, but you're agreeing to work for them for X amount of time as part of that training and, and that investment in you. Um, and as, as you go up and your skill base increases, your pay would increase. Um, that program may not be for every student. But there are students who are attending our, our programs who know that's what I want to do for a living. I want to be a machinist. So we can set up that with an approved apprenticeship. We can get their foot in the door and they'll give them those skills and that higher wages and that training to move them up the ladder with their commitment that they're investing in the worker, that the worker will be invested back into the, the employer. And they're saying, uh, as I look through the data, that Typically, they're seeing about a 94% retainment rate of people who complete the apprenticeships. Um, so there is a, a, a reward for the employer in doing this, that the employer is seeing $1.47 for every dollar they invest a return on their investment with the, with the student as they complete the programs. But like I said, there is a commitment level in this, and, and that has to be the student, the parents, the family, they all have to be on board with when they, when they enter that program. Um, so again, we have three different programs. We have our traditional co-op, which would benefit any student enrolled in ICTC that would be part of our completer status programs our senior year would be eligible. We have the diversified occupations. We could serve any senior in the county. And then we have the pre-apprenticeship for the student who's really focused on that career, and that's where I want to be. 
and we can probably provide those relationships. So um, those are the work-based learning opportunities we have currently and that we're working on at the ICTC. Um, and our goal, as you go to the last slide in summary, is just basically that we're committed to providing opportunities to all the students of Indiana County. Um, we look forward to partnering with any of our sending schools. And basically, we're here just to serve and, and do the best we can for the students of this county. So uh, if there's any questions related to the work-based learning opportunities, we'll answer them now. And Mr. Harris, so you know, we're trying to build out a career pathways for the Indiana Area School District, and this will be a part of that recipe, what that looks like. Embedded that would be uh, career opportunities as well as dual enrollment opportunities. So we're just trying to really put a system together, show everyone what that looks like and what the opportunities are in this district. And in, more important, this county, we believe in grow your own. We believe in trying to keep our best and brightest here. And we're trying to prevent them opportunities. And, you know, rather than wasting time and trying to figure out what they want, try to, you know, teach them to be motivational, inspirational, but also aspirational and give them opportunities uh, along the way, sir. So any other questions we'll, we'll, we'll take for the group, but it's really a part of the good work we're doing at the high school um, in the area of learning pathways. It seems like it interfaces with what we're trying to do extremely well. It's like Mike's been part of our committee. So that's great. Well, Wade and I've had several conversations. We had one today. <laughs> um, I don't believe this takes any board action. Nope. These are all non agenda items. This is okay. just an update. Yeah. Okay. So um, any, anything for the committee? No. no. Okay. Let's move on then. Um, next, I always need to do a better job of trying to recognize the, the teachers and the principals and all the good work they do. Uh, Kelly gave me a phone call the blue one day saying, hey, look, there's really people impressed with what we're doing. So I said, well, Kelly, why don't you tell the academic community? Because a lot of the work is being done by Aaron, Kelly, Krista, and Dawn, and the engine, Shelly, and April, really not me. So I wanted to give them the form, talk about the good, because usually we only tell you about the bad or we ask you for money. So we thought we'd tell you some good things today, a little bit. Sure. So um, last spring, I was um, just Google searching um, some ideas for reading science to share with my staff. And I stumbled upon a university in Cincinnati, Mount St. Joseph. Uh, They're offering a reading science certificate, which is essentially a reading specialist certificate. Uh, knowing that I was going to be an empty nester this fall and uh, having a lot of extra time in my hands with both my babies gone, I needed to do something. And so I, on a whim, enrolled. And uh, so I'm an online learner right now. And this fall, I participated in two different classes. And through the platform, um, weekly, I'm expected to answer a question that typically has to deal with curriculum and programming or schedules, data, MTSS, um, you know, things that we're living every day. And, you know, I, I'm just answering the question. And then it's my responsibility to read other what other people are having to say. And then we, we um, respond to one another. And I just kept getting a lot of hits on, you know, things that I was writing about and a lot of questions about what we're doing to the point that uh, we have a district in the Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay Area in California that is trying to obtain permission um, from their county uh, if it's safe enough to travel. They would like to come to Indiana and see what we're doing. They want to bring a small team. Uh, there's another district in the state of uh, Ohio that is also very interested uh, in seeing what we are doing. And then recently, uh, um, uh, District in Michigan has reached out uh, just to see if we could even maybe, you know, as a principal team, just kind of meet with them and talk through some of the things that we are doing. So, I, I you know, I'm just talking about just thinking I'm just everybody's doing this right. And it doesn't seem to be that way. And we are really raising some eyebrows and um, people have said, you know, my gosh, I wish I was in your district. My goodness, I would give anything to be teaching in your school. So it's just really nice to hear. I wanted to share that with you. And, um, you know, in a couple months, I may be um, asking for permission to allow some um, other school districts to actually visit to see how our school days are running. So um, you just thank you for um, really That's great. That's helping us do this good work because we are doing great things for children in the area of literacy. And um, I'm very excited to also um, let you know that I've been accepted into their doctoral program. And so Finale. I'll be doing that the summer I start. And um, yeah, I don't know what I got myself into, but uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Yes, okay. Great. Uh, yes. Next, and Mr. Harley, after this one, if you want to stop and we can add these to the following month, it's up to you. But uh, for the sake of time, but I would like to get through the next one, at least number four. I'd like to turn the floor over 
to Mr. Heinrich. Um, if, we he has them, been... if we get through number four, we can do the rest of it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I, like, I tried, everyone. <laughs> I, I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Heinrich. As you know, you've uh, the board has asked us to make some changes and do some uh, examinations of our socially scope and sequence. And Rob and the teachers have done an incredible job working through this, and he has uh, a brief update. I believe he present you a video update previously, but want to provide you one this evening as well for the sake of transparency. So, so Rob, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, good evening, everyone. I apologize for not being able to be there myself tonight. Can everybody see the slideshow? It's coming. Go ahead. There you go. Okay, I just wanted to take a few minutes to update the board and the community on the progress that the Social Studies Curriculum Committee has made. Uh, it is their turn in the rotation, as you know, to <clears throat> we rotate through each subject area every six years or so, and Social Studies and Science are up this year to uh, review their, their current program and make updates. The Academic Committee has had several discussions about the importance of civics education and um, making that a priority and the committee shares the curriculum committee shares the academic committee's uh, concerns and and uh, beliefs on that and they worked very very hard over the last few months to uh, to work through the best way to make those things a priority so a brief overview of the process in october we formed the committees it has been difficult to have these meetings given the lack of subs that we've had and the increased amount of teachers missing school because of you know COVID-19 and uh, precautions regarding COVID-19. But we did manage to have a few meetings, and those meetings were very productive. Uh, the committee spent an entire uh, entire day reviewing the existing programs and developing a mission and goals and direction for the committee's work. Uh, then they were able to uh, look at the current scope and sequence, and really dis and put together a scope and sequence. Um, that they think is going to be more in line with what the academic committee wants, and that's what we're going to ask for uh, approval, uh, quote unquote approval. It's not technically board approval, but we just want to make sure that we have permission to move forward with this plan before we get too far uh, down the road and then find out that we're doing something that is not does not please the committee. Um, so this was the the mission statement that they made, and again, it, the summary is basically this. Any good social studies curriculum and, and program is going to produce informed electorate, and a, a, an informed group of citizens who know how to think, know how to uh, analyze, know how to get along, know how to compromise. And that's uh, the mission of, of our program as well, to create people who have the knowledge, skills, and habits of mind necessary for success in our American society. Um, I'm going to review some of the goals they have here. You'll see number one, for, uh, front and foremost, is effective citizenship. We want students to have an appreciation and understanding of our democracy and our system and the strengths and weaknesses of that system. We want students to be able to analyze information, access information responsibly, which is a huge uh, issue now with social media um, being a, a, the number one way that people receive information and not always the best way. Uh, we want people to be able to respect diverse viewpoints and find compromise, which is the beauty of our system. Uh, we want people to be able to make positive contributions to their school and understand that they have a responsibility to, uh, that the American process is, is actual work. You have to participate in the process and make contributions to the process. To that end, we want students to understand and make meaningful uh, connections. We want them to make connections between the past and the present. We want them to be able to connect economics and politics and geography. We want them to understand um, that culture affects human interaction and that um, um, the, sorry, my dog might go crazy here in a second. The, um, uh, the culture affects how humans interact and, and those human interactions are really at the, at the root and the heart of all of our, of our democracy and our community. Um, and that students can um, apply what they've learned. We want, we also focus, and this is where I'm, I'm most proud of the teachers, and I need to stop and give kudos to the, the work that they've done. The teachers in this process have been very, very reflective on their own practice. And I think that's, we took a long time and talked about how we currently teach and how we should be teaching. And uh, made a, a, an agreement, basically, that we do not want to pound facts into people. We want to teach kids how to think. 
not what to think, never teach them what to think, but we want to teach them how to think, how to, to access information responsibly, how to analyze that information, how to, uh, you know, have, you know, um, true understanding of the tools that uh, for disseminating information, those kinds of things, and, and really go deep into their, their knowledge rather than just this wide breadth of facts that um, sometimes social studies content um, deteriorates to. So, um, I was really pr uh, proud of the work that they've done there and and um, excited to see where this goes um, to having a real meaningful program. So um, the program overview is basically this. We're going to build something that is scaffolded from kindergarten all the way up through 12th, uh, 12th grade and instruction that, that focuses on developing the characteristics of effective citizenship. That's the focus of everything, you know, uh, uh, the backdrop of uh of all the things that we teach um obviously we're going to teach all of the standards in civics economics geography history and all of the related social studies um, we're going to focus on teaching techniques that require deep thought and further and a higher depth of knowledge than um, just the base uh, remote or uh rote uh factual memorization um and the courses in K-5 will supplement and reinforce the skills taught in the CKLA curriculum and the ELA programs. And courses in grades 6 through 12 will develop historical context to enhance the study of government and the social sciences. And by the time they get to the, the 12th or the senior high, they should be prepared to have those meaningful debates and discussions and talk about the, uh, the topics that, have, that are meaningful to them and do so in a dignified way and so that they can really disagree and dissent with dignity, which we think is very important. As I mentioned, CKLA, the groundwork is already laid. A program at our K through five is um, uses nonfiction text as the backdrop. And a lot of that nonfiction text is social studies. Um, instead of uh, reading stories that are fictional, uh, we always make the, the kind of joke, instead of learning about bears having a picnic in the wood, in the woods, they're going to learn about the Civil War. They're going to learn about explorers. They're going to learn about civil rights leaders or um, you know, the, the Constitution. And um, so we're, we're really proud of that move. We're going to hopefully build on that knowledge. And then the social studies curriculum piece will be a, a connection and, a, and focus on some of the same learnings that, they, that they've had in ELA class and really allow them to go deeper. So we make that, that real depth of knowledge and that background knowledge is necessary to have deeper learning down the road. So the scope and sequence is here. And again, this is driven with those, those goals in mind that the committee set. Uh, with, we're going to build effective citizens who can make connections, and we're going to do so with effective, authentic uh, teaching practices. And of course, we're going to tie it to the state standards because that's what the state expects us to accomplish. So uh, they came up with a scope and sequence, as you can see here, and I've connected the, uh, attached the presentation to the agenda if anyone wants to review it uh, more slowly and more in depth later. Um, but as you can see, it's going to start real small and, and centered. In kindergarten, um, our PADS program uh, teaches them about rules and responsibilities. CKLA talks to them about uh, maybe the explorers, the early explorers, but, but it talks um, community. And that's the focus of social studies in, in kindergarten, my community. Then it moves out a little bit further as we move through first and second grade. And it goes from my community to my local area. And then from my local area to my, my local area, my state, from my local area state to my region, my region to my country, and then finally America on the world stage mm -hmm. and, um, and into history in the sixth, and, sixth through eighth grade, the foundations of democracy, the legacy of Greece and Rome, and those connections we talked about, what happened in Greece all those years ago and how that affects how our government works here today. Um, we, as we move into high school, this is where the big change comes. Typically in ninth grade, that's where our civics class sits now. Um, what we're recommending is that America in the world, which is our history class, it's our America and world history class rolled into one, moves from 10th grade to ninth grade. The 11th class history, history class moves from 11th grade to 10th grade. And that civics class moves to 11th grade and or 12th grade, depending on uh, the student's individual situation. It is a graduation requirement. 
and it gets um, built out a little bit more. So it, it covers all those typical principles that we talk about in ninth grade currently, but then it moves on to the American government process and America and current affairs. And so that they can have those discussions at a time in their life where the rules now apply to them, the law now applies to them. What's happening in uh, the Ukraine, so to speak, is very, very real to students who are registering for the draft when they're looking at how, you know, Ukraine, if Ukraine joins NATO and Russia would invade Ukraine, this has real meaning in their lives. And those are the connections we want to have them make um, in meaningful ways. And um, so I'm proud of what they've done so far. And I think we're, we've at least have the outline here to really get them to a great spot. Um, as far as electives are concerned, 12th grade, I'm sorry, they'll have economics and then they'll have a semester of electives. Um, those electives uh, are either anthropology, law and justice, psychology, or sociology are the most popular. They also, throughout their ninth through 12th grade years, will have the opportunity to take part in, in rotating electives. Uh, there are four electives that rotate each year, and then there's a few other uh, social studies-based electives that are offered based on interest. If enough students sign up for them, they're offered. If enough students don't, uh, not enough students sign up for them, we don't offer them that year, but we try to make sure they're offered once, at least once in each student's career. So those students who love social studies uh, have the opportunity to have a really robust um, offering of electives, which was another uh, important focus of the committee. So in summary, here's what we're recommending, moving that civics class from ninth grade uh, to the 12th, 11th grade class and making a much more um, in-depth and meaningful class uh, that is wider in scope and deeper in uh, discussion and, and connections. We're gonna create that K through 12 program that focuses on citizenship and civic engagement from the very get go and builds out to their 12th grade and their culminating project where they are actually getting experiences uh, local government or it, uh, you know, at least uh, community service of some type through our career pathways. Um, and ensuring that as many courses as possible are available for dual enrollment in college and high school opportunities while maintaining those AP options. So basically what we've, what we've done here, what we've tried to do, and I think the committee of the teachers did a great job, is to take what we have, make it better, uh, make it more um, in line, aligned and, um, and meaningful, and then make sure that students have options, that those electives still stay uh, available for students that the AP program still becomes available for students, but families wanna take advantage of college and high school or dual enrollment, that they can have those opportunities um, while we, we build these citizens um, who are ready for American society. So uh, here real quick is the current uh, senior high scoping sequence on the left and the proposed changes on the right. Um, and again, it's just moving that class down uh, in the rotation and making it a little bit more um, robust. And there is going to be a cost associated with this. There's going to be some curriculum writing and there's going to be some new costs, obviously, when we make a new class. Um, those costs are things that we've already budgeted for. They're recurring costs every so often. They're not going to be a shock. Um, they happen every year. But the new materials needed for the bubble is another. It's going to be an additional cost that we don't necessarily have budgeted. Now, I'm sure Jared can work his magic and this isn't going to bankrupt us or anything. But I did want you to be aware that by moving those classes up, we could experience a cost in materials, um, whether it be more textbooks or uh, online subscriptions or software subscriptions or whatever it might be, because we're going to have um, twice as many students taking the same class at the same time for, for a few years. So that uh, cost is going to be, there's going to be a real cost and a potential opportunity cost with the staff being focused on teaching those uh, those required courses. So next steps with the board's or with the committee's permission um, over the next few months, we're going to develop the, the planned courses um, and do that curriculum writing. That's important. We're going to uh, review the available resources and programs that might be available that align that align with what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to come back to you in um, you know, March through June to make sure that you approve those purchases if any are required and approve the, the final curriculum uh, as a whole so that we can then order the materials in July. And so they are here ready for implementation in August of 2022. So I know I went very, very fast. I hope I, I covered everything that um, everyone was concerned about. 
but do I have uh, and I heard a question, but I can't really see you at the moment. Jersey has a question. Yes, ma'am, Miss Miss Cunningham. You may be muted because I, I don't hear you talking. Uh, I'm really, really pleased with with the work that went into this uh, curriculum rewriting. Um, the emphasis from uh, community to nation to world and moving up through the grades is really, really commendable. Um, I'm glad that it's a graduation requirement in 11th grade and that it's a full year the government and civics part because it's essential to these young people coming out to understand their role and and what what has come before them and what is ahead of them the one thing that i would recommend as a member of this committee and as a former social studies teacher and civics teacher is that the the state requires testing of civics in I believe the junior year, I would ask that that be a testing, not only for the state, but something a little bit more rigorous. Whereas if a student does not pass that test at the end of the school year of their junior year, they have to remediate and retake in their senior year. We are sending 18 year olds out into the world. You mentioned the Ukraine. I can mention several other instances where they're going to be called upon to take part in many, many things. And I would think that it would be very important that they be as knowledgeable as, as possible. And I think by putting the, some rigor into that testing would absolutely ensure that. So that's my only recommendation. I kudos to my former colleagues. Um, the, the emphasis on community and then on nation and then on the world is really, really very good. So that's my recommendation. Yes, ma'am. And, and just for the board and, and the committee's understanding, Act 35, uh, Pennsylvania Act 35 requires that we do have an end of course test, um, that we report the results to the state at the end, but there is no, currently no requirement by the law that the students have to pass that to graduate. So what Ms. Cunningham's recommending, I believe, is that we as a board would say, we we want that to almost be a graduation requirement where if they don't, if they don't pass that test to our, you know, whatever the mastery level we dis define, that we, instead of that elective in the second half of their senior year, we give them um, a remediation in that course and and test them again. Uh, to put the emphasis on that and that's definitely something this committee can discuss um moving forward mr harley uh we don't necessarily have to decide that today but um it's definitely something worth discussing miss bro let's, let's see what cinda has to say cinda so i totally agree with everything that josie said i do have a question about the presentation on the summary slide where you say um, you recommend number one, moving the civics and government course currently offered in the ninth grade to the 11th or 12th grade year. And then it says, depending on the student's individual situation. Could you explain that, please? What, what situation could happen that would change that? And how Absolutely. would it change it? Um, it would simply be offered either their 11th grade year or their 12th grade year, depending on their scheduling situation. Um, I just don't, I don't want to tell you that every single child is going to take this their 11th grade year because, you know, uh, that just might not be possible. ICTC students have much smaller, uh, have a much more narrow scheduling window. Um, they, they don't have as much flexibility in their schedule. Um, students taking dual enrollment classes may have to bump something from their 11th grade year to their 12th grade year. I just don't want to deal in absolutes and say to you that everyone's going to take the 11th grade. It will be their 11th or 12th grade year depending on their scheduling situation, but everyone will take the course. Uh, you've, uh, the board already made um, American government and civics a graduation requirement previously. So that means that every year, one teacher will be teaching a full year of civics in 11th grade and a full year of civics in 12th grade? Uh, not necessarily, um, but potentially. We're going to try to get as many of them through the 11th grade year as possible. That's our goal. Um, but for those outliers that don't fit, they're graders. 
um, or 12th graders in one of the 11th grade classes. Once again, it's just to show that there's flexibility as we move into those class, those years where the student schedules become much more complex. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And then my last yes, kind of comment. Oh, I'm sorry, um, go ahead. Our school district is very proactive and really good at uh, instituting programs and policies that are way ahead of everybody else. And I know that there is no requirement by the state for the students to have any specific score on the Act 35 test, but I think it would be really wise for us to set a, a, a required level of achievement on that test. And then, as Josie suggested, if you don't, re if you don't achieve that level in 11th grade, do a remediation and you just said that it could be possible to have a teacher teaching that in 12th grade, but do a remediation one semester and then take the exam or test again. I just, I think it's really important because I think with the big move in social studies to start putting civics back in the high schools and putting the, the spotlight on it, I think sooner or later there will be a requirement to pass that test at a certain level. And we might as well do it before everybody else. Josie, your, your hands back up. Um, I, I agree that we need that rigor in that testing. And the other thing I'm very grateful for is that the ICT students are not going to be exempted. I, I believe that democracy requires participation from everyone, and it requires that they undergo the same type of learning. So I, I like that, and I like the idea that we do, we have superseded the state in many areas where state requirements have been less than what we have put upon our students in our district because we have been so proactive. So I would look to some sort of rigorous testing. We are sending citizens out into the, into the world to formulate policies and, and procedures for the future. So I think, it, I think it's worth our while. Thank you. Tom, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead first, Sue. Uh, my comment is I agree with the scope and sequence. I think the teachers did an excellent job of building, uh, like Josie said, scaffolding from kindergarten, me, myself, out to the world. Um, I do have an issue, though, with one test for a student to prove that they know the information. Um, I wrote a dissertation on assessment, and especially of students at risk, and I can't, there are just students who are not good test takers. And for them, if they don't pass it, then the next time, then what happens? Now, are they never going to graduate because of one social studies test? I don't think that's a, I, I would not support that. Okay. Um, Tom, I, um, my question is primarily for Rob. Um, you mentioned that some of these courses uh, would be taken to a level of, of uh, college in the classroom or dual enrollment. Um, do, you, do you have even an inkling? And maybe because we're, we're a little short on time here tonight, maybe not so much for tonight, but for maybe next um, uh, month's uh, committee meeting, what classes you're looking at to take to that level? Because uh, that's something I really think we should should try to do, especially for the electives and if possible for that um, uh, 11th, 12th grade civics um, uh, class that, 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 you're, that you're taking uh, or that you're changing to now, uh, because I, I, I really think that's something that would really enhance the program at this point. Well, I saw what Wade looked like he was busting the, to answer my question. Yes, Mr. Schroth, uh, one of the items, if we get to it, is the pathways plan. It includes, and you'll see, uh, those dual credit courses, whether they're IUP, WCCC, or Mount Aloysius, courses have been designated as electives that can substitute for a number of our courses. It's, it's not, it, not, just, not just Wade, the, the, those dual enrollment, but I think we should take and raise the level of some of those electives that we teach in-house to college in the classroom level. 
is 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 what I'm advocating. Uh, I certainly yes, agree that, and the, that the other courses should be acceptable for substitutes, but I really think we need to raise the level of the electives that we have to that college in the classroom level. We can absolutely get you a report of uh, which classes already are eligible for those and uh, which classes we believe we could get to that level, sir, by the next committee meeting. That's no problem at all. Um, to Wade's credit and to the credit again of his teachers, um, they've done a great job already. I think we're, Wade can correct me, but I think we're over 50 courses now that have, uh, have risen to that level um, where they have opportunity for dual enrollment or college and high school credit. So they've done a tremendous amount of work uh, laying the groundwork for that. So we can give you a full report on that next time for sure. Well, that's Thank you, um, Rob. The uh, I'm glad you I'm glad you took the extra time to um, engage the whole district from uh, kindergarten on up. Uh, that you have a a sequence of events that build on each other. I think it's uh, the the sequence is quite uh, quite encouraging. Um, that we could uh, really um, take a hard look at this. And I mean. They've done yeoman work on this. It's really quite quite impressive. Um, I agree with Josie um, that the uh, um, that junior course can't be a slough course. Um, it has to be. Um, um, and I also agree with Dr. Rigg about the test. But at the same time, we need something that goes that 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 certifies these kids are are successful. The test that was submitted to us um, it was a fact test. And what I'm understanding, this is going to be teaching kids to think. And so we need a different test format. Uh, Lord knows what that's going to look like. So, <laughs> so I'm anxious to see what you uh, bring to us at our next meeting, Rob. Yes, sir. We can, we can definitely continue to develop that as we move forward. And as the conversation about what, what does competency look like for these, uh, for these students. The committee, again, I do want to you know, beat the drum for those teachers. They have done... A tremendous amount of work all i did was set the table for them they really did all the work uh, uh mr duty uh, mr shooty matt neal um and melissa nybert and jen beard i mean there, there's so there's so many of them that have done such great work um all the way down uh to the elementary school so um they've they've done it and they've really designed it so that 11th grade course is like the uh the main event they know that that's the the culminating um uh, purpose class you know if we've done our job that they can uh, demonstrate proficiency there and i agree with you that test that we developed does need to be further developed and uh, we'll continue to work on that as we move forward so, mrs cunningham has her has her hand up again sir oh not again jersey ah <clears throat> uh, yes tom i do uh, <laughs> uh dr Riggs' point was well taken and i I hate to be the person to go back in time, but having taught ninth grade civics for several years and having not done it in sections because we believed in democracy that everyone should be participatory in the classroom, when we tested our students for their final, we did have different finals for the skill students. I think Dr. Reek is concerned about some of the students having them one test for all. Uh, that can be easily remedied and it can suit the purpose of what we're talking about. Um, so that's something that with critical thinking, we found even our students who were marginal uh, did very well with once the test was developed towards their needs and their skills. So that can be done. And I do wanna applaud again, the faculty for working so, so well on this. And uh, I, I can't wait till it comes to a culmination. Thank you. Okay, very good. Anything else on this? Okay, let's let's do 50 courses in 35 seconds. Well, I'll do real quick. I'll take care of five and six. <laughs> um, there's they're hyperlinked. You can look over it. We can discuss it in February, but take time to look at it, and it hopefully reflects and mirrors exactly what the task that the board gave us that we met in regards to increasing the number of opportunities for kids. Uh, and you can look at the pathways plan and take a take it some minutes to look at that in February. We can address any questions. And then item number six, I just want to recognize the high school team. Um, as you know, we are uh, obligated by law to do some career readiness work here in the district, as all schools in Pennsylvania are. 
but we really took it to the next level to the point where now our, our team was recognized by Castle and now is recognized by PDE. And Wade was able to bring a group of teachers out and present at the SAS conference. So we're really going above and beyond. We have, yes, we have a lot more to do. And yes, we're not there yet, but there's a lot of great things happening. So I just wanted to recognize them in, in um, publicly about the good work they're doing. So uh, we'll make those two quick if that's okay with okay, you, Mr. That's Arnold. quick enough. I'll do uh, seven and eight if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, eight is um, um, uh, the AD did a survey um, a while ago. There were 60 some girls responded that they're interested in field hockey. Um, I approached White Township. Uh, they have equipment and they have some coaches and some, some uh, folks who are interested in coaching field hockey. Um, it, it's no obligation to the to the district, but what the district, what White Township would like to do is to reach out to those 60 kids, and then the other kids that might be interested, and see what they what their level of interest is um, on getting field hockey started. This is this would be um, 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 a decade or two away from this becoming a varsity sport, but this would be our helping White Township get started on something that might help us in the future. So we need we need that authorization for that survey from for, on the agenda, Mike. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there any objection to that? None? Okay. Put it on. And then the, the item seven, we'll come back to that. It's obvious to me that we can't increase our female participation by, by um, from uh, AD's uh, survey of, um, of, of various sports, um, that we need to increase the number of females that are participating in our existing sports, and we need some discussion about that in our next well said. Succinct enough. I think we have thirty minutes before the game. No, starts. I think we're good. <laughs> I think everyone's good. Thank you for this. Really may be okay with this. <laughs> Respectfully. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and joining us. Have a good night.